Good morning, this is the JBS Show. I'm Ian Lee, standing in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith, and on the big phone-in, I'm asking, have you been affected by a claim for whiplash? New figures show that the number of people making personal injury claims after a car accident has risen by 20%, despite a 10% drop in the number of car accidents. A report has been put together by the actuarial profession which blames aggressive claims companies for the rise in whiplash cases. False claims are thought to add at least £90 a year to the cost of a typical car insurance policy. The problem is, whiplash is impossible to prove. But many of the cases are, of course, legitimate. Susan in Hatfield made a claim after her car was hit from behind. She was eventually awarded £4,000 after suffering continued discomfort. After four years, I thought, well, enough's enough. So I said I wanted to settle. They advised me not to settle because they said that, you know, whiplash could go on. And obviously, the longer it goes on, the bigger your claim will be. Well, there's no doubt that many people like Susan do suffer the after effects of whiplash for a long time. But when there's money on offer, there are also those who swing the lead just to line their own pockets. So today I'm asking, have you been affected by a claim for whiplash? Whatever your story, I would love to hear it. Perhaps you've just had an accident and been plagued by claims companies wanting to know if you're suffering from whiplash, who are prepared to take your case on. Maybe you don't blame people who put in false claims because you feel the insurance industry charges so much in the first place. It's no surprise they tried to get money out of the system some other way. Or perhaps someone claimed whiplash in a car accident that you've been involved in and you cannot believe they've been able to get away with it when there was no way they could have been injured in the way they said. Today, I'm asking you, have you been affected by a claim for whiplash? Call me now, 08459 455 555. You can text 81333, start your text 3CR, or email jvsshow at bbc.co.uk. The JVS Show. Share your view. Make your point. Call 08459 455 555. That's 08459 455 555. The JVS Show. BBC Three Counties Radio. I've had uh, these claim companies phone me up. I met one phone me up about a year. I said about six months to David, but it was about a year after the accident happened. And I was so out of the, the surprise and shock. I, I, he said, I didn't believe you've been in an accident, sir. I said, no, I don't think so. No, 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 we, 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 we know you've been in an accident, sir. We just wondered if you've been injured at all. And there's, there's soppy old me going, um, I don't think I've been in a... And then it dawned on me, it was a year previously. Uh, and then I kind of sussed that, sussed that these guys were out to make a fast buck. And I sent them on there. I don't like... Um, I very rarely answer my mobile phone. And if it's a withheld number, never answer it. But I answered it at this point, and it was these companies. Have you had them phone you up? Because they're quite, they're quite persuasive, aren't they? They come over all friendly and all matey. And they're quite persuasive. If they've called you, 08459 455 555. And I'm, guess, I'm guessing they get your details from the insurance company. Is that allowed? Are they allowed to do that? I, didn't, I thought there was some kind of law. I'm guessing here. Can you tell? I thought there was some kind of law that said the insurance company couldn't give your details on to a third party. Is that true? If you work for an insurance company, don't mention the company's names, but do come on, because I'd, I'd be keen to know what the legality is on that. 08459 455 555. And also, this is who I'm really keen to talk to. If you've made a claim for something like whiplash, and you did it, and there was nothing wrong with you, you just thought, this is a bit of easy money... I might as well. I'm paying enough insurance. I don't really get a lot out of it. I might as well get a grand or 1,500 quid. You can come on. You can change your name if you want. And, I'm, you know, I have to say, for legal reasons, of course, it's very naughty and we don't condone it. But I'm intrigued to speak to you and find out if you've done that and why you did it and how much money you got. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give me a call on this. John is in Bedford. Good morning, John. Good morning, Ian. Uh, John, what happened to you? Um, I was on my way to work back in January. Yeah. Um, Travelling down the A1. And yes, I know. Some, somebody hit me up the backside at about 40 miles an hour. Cheeky, yes. Um, it was one of those unfortunate things. 
we got out, we swapped names, addresses, and I felt fine. Um, and within a week, I got a, a phone call from a soliciting company yeah. saying, oh, you were in an accident. And I said, well, how did you get my name? Oh, well, that doesn't matter how you got your name. Do you want to make a claim? And I said, no, I don't. Um, I said, there's nothing wrong with me. And uh, oh, he can get you a few thousand pounds. Oh, and I said, look, I'm not interested, like you were just saying yourself. Yeah. Um, but about a fortnight later, I started getting a bit of stiffness in my neck, and I went to the doctors. And uh, they said it's a, as a result of the accident. So how, how long after the accident did you start getting the stiffness? 10, 10 14 days afterwards. Okay. And, um, so I thought, oh, you know, this is... So I ended up going to, um, osteopath. Yep. I've had osteopathic treatment. I've had, um, acupuncture. I've had physiotherapy. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's cost me over £500. Right. So I've now decided to make a claim to my own. So not, not one of these, um, tin pop companies. Yeah. My own solicitor. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, it wasn't my fault, um, and I don't see why I should be an additional £500 out of pocket. Well, listen, if it's a legitimate claim, then that seems fair enough. I'm surprised. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a doctor, John. I don't know if you're aware of that. I'm, I have no me- very little medical training, yeah. let's say. I'm surprised that Whiplash can come on a fortnight after the incident. I, I always assumed it would be an immediate or, or almost immediate effect. Yeah, well, that, that's what happened with me, uh, and I've, I've seen various other people, and, and they've all said it's a whiplash injury. How much money do you reckon you're going to get? I haven't a clue. Right. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not um, claiming for the actual injury itself. I'm yeah. claiming for the out-of-pocket expenses that yeah. I've received, I've had to incur. So as long, as long as you get your 500-odd quid back, you're happy, you're not that bothered about getting some form of, of compensation no, no, on top no. of that? No, not at all. How do you feel, John? Yours is a legitimate claim. How do you feel about those naughty people that do do the dodgy claims? Because they're putting your car insurance up. They, they are. Uh, and it, it all boils down. I mean, like, like you were saying here, these, these insurance companies, they must pass on my information yeah. to these sorts of people because how did they know so quick? Yeah. I mean... It was obviously uh, either my insurance company or the person that hit me up the backside, his insurance company, that must have passed my name on. And so someone in the insurance company must be getting a few quid. It's like, hey, every time you give us a name, we'll give you 50 quid. There's got to be something like that going on, isn't there? It's got to be. Got to uh, be. John, very quickly, two quick things. You had the um, the osteopathy. Did he did he click your back? Oh, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it good? Uh, uh, I thought that everything was falling apart when he did it. I love the cl- I love the clicking of the back. It's my favourite favourite thing. And also acupuncture. Did did it have any effect on you? Yes, it did. Really? Yeah. Oh, this is this is a debate I, for another day because I've had acupuncture and I, 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 I it, it just hurt. I don't think it had any effect. Well, uh, I when I was seeing the uh, osteopath, he was an acupuncturist yes, as well. They often are. And he stuck the needles in, and yes, it did hurt. It does hurt. John, listen, I'm going to leave there because the line's not great. Thank you for that. The needles do hurt. I know we're going off on a slight tangent now already. It only, where are we? 13 minutes past nine. I apologise uh, for that. Well, there was John with a legitimate claim. Uh, and that, I am surprised that, that, that Whiplash can come on, I'm not in any way doubting what he said, uh, but that it can come on a fortnight later. I can imagine you possibly, you know, after the accident, you're full of adrenaline, and because it, it's you know it's an exciting thing. I don't mean that in a positive way, but th- th- there is an adrenaline rush. So maybe you don't feel any injuries or anything. So perhaps the next day you might wake up and and, and be a bit stiff. But a, a fortnight later, is that is that possible? I don't know. Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Maybe maybe a doctor could come on and let us know. Uh, Jean is in Bedford. Hello, Jean. Hello, Jean. What can I do for you? What have you got? Uh, yesterday, I was pro- I had a telephone call. The lady said. With them, so and so solutions. Okay, don't, don't tell us anymore. No, I don't know. I can't remember what that Good. was. That, the other bit was solutions. Yes. And I said, and who do you want? She asked me. You had a claim, she said, two years ago, gave me the date. Yeah. Lots of people in your car. Oh, no, I said, completely untrue. It was only me in a stationary car. 
Um, she went on and on and on and wanted to know. And I kept asking her questions. In the end, I asked too many and she hung up. So I rang my insurance company and he said, after you've, the claim is finished, which was yeah. two years ago, he said, we put everything on a computer and these companies scan these computers what? and just pick people out. What, well, what, what computer do they put them on? I don't know, but this is what the insurance company I'm with, and I'm with Age Concern and the company that they deal with. Okay. And he said, yes, when the claim is finished, and my claim is finished in the November, yeah. it then gets put on a computer. What questions were you asking the, the, the person from this, this uh, claims I asked company? Who she was. Yeah. How did she find out? How dare you ask those questions? <laughs> I asked and asked and asked. Every time she asked me a question, I asked her a question. And then she put the phone down on you? Yes. And I'm guessing you, it was a withheld number? Yes. Yeah, of course it was. So that was yesterday lunchtime. Two years after an accident, you get a phone call? Yes. Were you tempted at any point to... Never. Really? No. You're all very honest, you BBC Three Counties listeners. I'm born honest, and I will be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, listen, thank you very much for that. 08459 four, five, 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 five. There's got... Uh, listen, uh, there will be someone listening to this right now who is not as honest as Jean, who was born honest. There'll be someone listening who... Th- listen, someone phones you up and says, listen, I can get you £1,500. That's kind of tempting, isn't it? Wait, uh, £1,500 is a lot of money for not really doing a lot. And we pay a lot to our insurance companies. I might tell you how much my insurance is later on. It's a lot of money. It's a lot, it's a lot of money. Partly because of my job. Partly because I've got a few points. And partly because maybe I had one or two accidents a few years ago. It's a lot of money, but it's more than yours. Uh, but we pay enough. We should be entitled to something back, shouldn't we? Oh, wait, 459 four, double, five, five, double, five. This is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith. How long after the accident can you make a claim? Because <clears throat> I've... It's funny, driving in, I was listening to David Brubo, who was also talking about this, and uh, I could feel my neck stiffening up, and I've got kind of tense neck and tense shoulders now. So maybe part of it's imaginary. You know, maybe part of it's imaginary. It's, it's kind of in your mind. The more he talked about it, the, 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 the stiffer my neck got. Can I make a claim for an accident? When was my last accident? I'm trying to think. Uh, about five years ago. I think four years ago. Can I make a claim on that? How long? How long is the the the, the, the time that you can make the claim? Oh wait, four five nine, four double five five double five. And I really want to talk to someone who has made a claim, but there has been absolutely nothing wrong with them. If that's you, you can call up. You can you know um, I was going to say put on a silly voice. That wouldn't be appropriate. But you could change your name, and um, we'd love to talk to you. Let's go to uh, Dorinda in Ware. Hello, Dorinda. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. What's your story? Right. Um, back in February, I got knocked down as a pedestrian. Oh, really? Well, how, how? Were you crossing the road, or what happened? Yes, the chap was uh, going too fast, oh. and I believe may have been on a mobile phone. Oh, I, listen, this is one of my bugbears, right? Is you see these idiots in cars, and you see that you see big trucks doing it, and they're texting away, or they're doing a phone call, and they're... they're I saw a guy a couple of weeks ago, big truck, turning around a tight corner, he had his f- phone in one hand, and was trying to do this tight corner, and I'm thinking, you're going to kill someone, you idiot. Yeah, well, anyway... S- yes, sorry, yes. I was taken off to hospital. Yes. And, uh, nothing badly broken, a hairline fracture of the hip, and they gave me crutches. Yeah. And then they gave me a leaflet on the use of crutches. Yes. And in that small leaflet, most of it was taken up by a full-page advert for an ambulance chaser. Right. Given out by a hospital, and I think that is despicable. So uh, you had a leaflet on how to use crutches. Yep. Which is, uh, okay. And uh, at the bottom of this, it said, by the way, you can claim for this, call this number and speak to Dodgepot lawyers, and we will... There was more information on the Dodgepot lawyers than there was on using the crutches. (laughs) And this came from the hospital? Yeah. Were you, now the thing is, you would have had a legitimate claim if you were taken to the hospital and you had a hairline crack, uh, fracture and uh, you were given crutches. You would have. That's that's a legitimate claim, isn't it? Yes, but I am claiming that through my own solicitor, a private solicitor, I wouldn't put money in the pockets of these. Right. But my son had an accident two years ago. He was reversing. Yeah. Somebody backed out of their drive, yeah. and he didn't. Was back out. He didn't see them. There was no damage. There was one small scrape on a bumper. Yeah. She claimed whiplash. And the, the, the thing about whiplash is, uh, uh, Dorinda, that, that you can't prove it. I could go to a I doctor know. now and say, oh, I can't turn my neck to the left oh, and it's a bit stiff. and pains she had that came through on the form for really? my son. And he said, Mum, it was impossible. He said, I didn't feel a thing. He said, it, 
there was a small scrape on my bumper, nothing on hers. And we were doing about naught, but about 0.3 of a mile. Incredible. So and you've got seven years to claim, by the way. Se- after an accident. Seven years? Yep. That <laughs> the more I hear about this, Dorinda, the more surprised I am. Do you think, I mean, that there are plans to, to tighten up the laws on this and that you would have to go and see an independent, I don't know, doctor or physiotherapist or osteopath or something uh, to, to be assessed? Again, you can fake it. Uh, do you think the law should be even tighter than that? Yes, I do, because our insurance premium, I mean, my insurance premium is quite low. I'm, a, I'm an older driver yeah. and I've, you know, had no, I haven't been a naughty girl yes. or haven't been caught for being a naughty girl. Well done. Um, but I feel sorry for these youngsters, you know, trying to get them on the road. Yeah. My, my kids have gone through it, and we've had to help them out with the first year, because you need transport living out in rural areas... Yeah, of course. ...to work. And they're being priced off the road by these ambulance chasers. Well, you hear stories, and I don't know if this is true or not, because I've only heard this on phone-in shows <laughs> and read it in newspapers, and I, I don't believe either of those things. Uh, but you do hear of, of, you know, like, 18-year-old drivers, uh, and their insurance policy is something like £3,500, oh, yes. and their car's worth a grand, if that. Yes. So it does seem unfair on uh, the young people. I think we should raise the limit, though, that people can start driving. 21. I said, well, well yes, but then you're disenfranchising the youngsters for getting yep. work, aren't you? Well, Public I don't know. transport is, is, is not good if you live out in the village. I wasn't... I, what, what age can you learn to drive? Is it 17? It's 17, 17, isn't it? I wasn't ready to drive at 17. I passed my test first time, and there is no way I was a responsible driver then. I think any new driver should be restricted for two years... There we go. ...to a very low-powered car. There we go. We, we could be onto something, Dorinda. I'm going to write this up and I'm going to send it off to the Department of Cars. Transport, that's I, it. I don't care if it's a youngster or an older person, but you, once you've got that yeah. licence, you have got a lethal weapon under your control. Good film. And you get these youngsters with rich parents who give them these high-powered cars and they're not fit to handle them, they're not experienced enough. And off they go and kill themselves and other people. Dorinda, on the converse, old people can be uh, not particularly good drivers. Oh, I know. We had to, uh, by fair means and foul, get a driving licence away from my father because he was well past being able to drive, but he wasn't going to give up. Dorinda, lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much. 08459 455 555 is the phone number. What could they do to tighten the law? The new changes are going to be that you go and you get assessed by someone independently who's not your GP. Because quite often GPs are f- far too busy with, with proper illnesses to properly assess you. And they go, oh, you got a whiplash? OK, yes, I'll sign that off. But I- is that good enough? Because you can fake whiplash, can't you? It's easy. You just go, oh, I can't, oh, can't turn that way. Oh, and that hurts. That's it. How can we tighten the laws? There's got to be. And I, I really hate people cold calling me and phoning me up. And I'm on the... Um, I was going to say the witness protection scheme. That's not it. I'm on the scheme where the, you, your number is taken off of, of, of the cold calling list. Uh, but I still get cold calls from people saying, just wondered if... Uh, and I hate that. Maybe we, th- that's where we have to start, is we make that kind of illegal for companies to phone you up and say, hey, believe you've been in an accident and um, we can help you. Gary. Hello, Gary. Hi. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. You're going for a whiplash claim, are you? I am, yes. Are you making the claim, or is someone making the claim against you? Well, um, at the moment, I'm trying... I'm, I'm making a claim um, against an insurance company. OK, no names, no pack drill. No, no. Thank you. Um, and um, what I'm trying to do is I've had a few companies trying to throw me to sort of, uh, you know, make money out of it. And what I've tried to deal directly with a particular insurance company um, and, and sort of come to a reasonable arrangement. So it's happened about two years ago. Um, and eventually, they sort of, and I, I saw their independent specialist, who was, um, you know, an expert in sort of back injuries, and he wrote them a report saying it's going to take about a year and a half for me to recover, and he gave his recommendations. But um, this particular insurance company hasn't really recouped a lot of the costs because I'm still I'm still going to physio, and um, eventually, what I've had to do now is go to a solicitor, and she said to me that the amount of money that I'm going to, that she's going to get is a lot more money than I'll get for my back injury from the insurance company. And I've, and I've tried to speak to them all the time. You know, I've been on the phone with them. I've been very safe. I've them, look, please can we resolve this? I don't want to go to a solicitor because the only person that's going to make the money is the solicitor. So hang on, you, sorry, you, sorry, Gary, are you saying that the solicitor herself is personally going to make more money than you would need for the claim? That's what she said to me, yes. Wow. 
And, and that's what frustrates me because I don't want, you know, everybody's insurance policy to go up. I just want to get, you know, the money for the, you know, for my back injury and the, and the physio. Um, and, and she says it's ridiculous. Maybe, I mean, this is part of the problem is when you phone uh, uh, an insurance company, big or small, it's, it's very hard to speak to a human being or someone that's not reading yeah. off of a script. Yes. And sometimes with these big corporations, what you need is you need someone and uh, all the greatest respect to the, the, the phone staff and all these people that work in these companies because they get a terrible time from angry people. But yes. you need someone on the phone who can look at the case, case by case, and make a decision and go, well, OK, yes, we can see this is the situation. We can see it would cost us a thousand pounds to pay for your physio. It would cost us three thousand pounds if we went to the solicitor. Let's see if we can reach a compromise. Yes. That's it. And that's exactly what I want to do. And what are the insurance companies saying? They just the, the, you, you're speaking to a, to a script, are you? Yes, um, and, and you know I'm, I'm not running down young guys at all, but it, you know it's a, it's a young guy who operates, who, who answers the phone, yep. who's my case manager, and um, you know he's just saying, well, there's nothing he can do, and um, you know if, if I want to sue the company, then then you know that's what I need to do. Have you done the thing, the, the thing I do that isn't so effective these days is, is the can I speak to your supervisor line. Have you tried that? Um, I have tried to speak to your supervisor and the supervisor came on and said, well, you know, there's not much we yeah. can do. This is the, you know, this is what we, we get um, from, from our legal team. Mm. It's frustrating, Gary. How, so how bad is the injury? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a T, it's called a T8 or T9 um, fracture of the back so i'm not i can walk and everything but i have a lot of pain in, the, in my back but um it's just going to be something i'm going to have to live with um it, you know it, i'll just have to live with it so you can't no more squash or tennis for you <laughs> well i'm sure i could do uh tennis but um i don't think it'll be doing anything of picking up oh, hang on. heavy things or anything like that hang on. gary can play tennis all of a sudden you're swinging the <laughs> leg my son for good get out of here <laughs> gary listen best of luck i hope it all works out for you Yes, thank you. There thank we you go. Much. Thank you very much. This is Ian Lee filling in for JVS. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Uh, it, 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 it turns out that I would really like to speak to someone who's made a, a, a fraudulent claim. And it is a fraudulent claim. Because you, come on, you can use a different name and, uh, you know, I, I won't be uh, judging you or anything like that. We have, to agree, we have to just say for legal reasons that we don't condone it. It's very, very naughty. Uh, we're not in any way uh, giving the thumbs up to this behaviour. It, it is illegal. But I would really like to hear from you. Uh, about why you did it, how much money you got, and is it because it is frustrating speaking to these insurance companies, isn't it? It's very, very rare. I had a case that went on for two years with an insurance company where a roof blew onto a hire car that I had. A roof blew onto a hire car, and I got all of the details from the, the, the company that owned this, this block of flats that the roof blew off and da la la. And for two years, I had to fight this because the, the, basically the, the, the company that owned the roof said, well, you know, it, it wasn't our fault. You shouldn't have parked there. Uh, and the insurance company went along with that. And I thought it had all been resolved. I got a letter through saying your premium's gone up by X amount of pounds. And I went bonkers. I phoned them up and said, hang on a second, how is this my fault? How can a roof blowing onto a car be my fault? It got resolved in the end, and they were very, very apologetic. But it is difficult to speak to a human being in these huge corporations, and that, I think, is partly where the problem is. Uh, if you've had whiplash, if you've made a whiplash claim, whether legitimately or illegitimately, I would love to speak to you this morning. We are, we are finding out uh, about if whiplash has affected your life in some way. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you wish to give us a call. Uh, time now to get the latest travel. This is Ian Lee filling in for JVS. More of your calls on 08459 455 555. Time now to get the latest news. On FM, AM and online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's the JVS Show. I'm Ian Lee, standing in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith. And after 11, I'll be looking at your consumer problems and going back to Hazel. Hazel was looking to meet some friends in India uh, in December of this year, so she booked up with an online agent for over £700. Two weeks later, she was informed that her airline was no longer operating and she'd have to apply for a refund. I got all my money back apart from £25, which they say is a cancellation fee, but I haven't cancelled. My friends that I was going with, they have got all their money back and I haven't. 
Hazel's contacted the agent to ask why she's being charged a cancellation fee when she hasn't cancelled anything. But so far, there have been no replies. What happened? Well, we'll find out a bit later on. And after 10, I'll be asking, is there an effective way of dealing with antisocial behaviour? There's been a lot about antisocial behaviour in the news over the last couple of weeks, and Jonathan did a programme about it recently. It was featured after people on a housing estate in Luton complained to the show about the behaviour of some of the other residents. One thing that came out of the interview was that residents were worried about the repercussions if those responsible found out they were making complaints. Well, Sarah from Hertfordshire was listening that day. She says it's vital that locals get together to fight this and that they're prepared to stand up and make themselves heard. She's finally helping to turn her street around after two and a half years of what she describes as hell. You can hear her story after ten. But back to the big phone in now. Have you been affected by a claim for whiplash? Despite a 10% decrease in the number of car accidents, there's been a 20% rise in the number of claims for whiplash. Those figures have come from the actuarial, you try saying that at this time, the morning profession, which believes the rise is due to aggressive claims management companies. False whiplash claims are thought to add at least £90 a year to the cost of a typical car insurance policy. Many of them are, of course, legitimate. We've heard some of those stories this morning. But whatever the circumstances, those claims can go on for years. Well, tell me your story. Have you been affected by a claim for whiplash? The phone number is 08459... Four double five, five double five. I, as I was listening, uh, listening to David, and I was driving in this morning. I remembered uh, about seven years ago, I bumped into the back of uh, someone's car, and the person got out, and I knew who she was. It was it was um, someone that I'd worked with in the past, and we kind of had a oh, isn't this silly? I'm really sorry, my fault. Uh, these are the insurance details. Let's do a little swap. Are you okay? Yep, everything's fine. I'm fine. You're fine. Fantastic. Really sorry. Um, best of luck. And we drove on to our me- uh, merry ways. And then the insurance came through. And then there was a claim for whiplash from her. And I felt really bad. I thought, oh, gosh, she seemed all right on the on the day. Oh, dear. I felt, I felt terrible. And she wasn't a particularly close friend. I didn't, I, I'd worked with her. She was more of a colleague. So I, I didn't really get in touch. I didn't think it was appropriate, but I felt really bad and um, uncomfortable that I could have injured someone like that. Then when I was driving in this morning, listening to David, I thought, hang on a minute. She was making it. She was doing one of those dodgepot claims because she was absolutely fine. And I know people are saying that it can come out the week, two weeks later, but she was absolutely fine. And it wasn't that big a a a crash. It wasn't. Was she getting one over on me? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. Let's go to Derek in Abbots Langley. Hello, Derek. Yeah, morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Although talking about this, my neck and my shoulders are starting to stiffen up a little bit. I might make a claim. Can I claim? Can I claim against David Prever because he started this? Yeah, I should think so. He's he's got enough money. He can afford it. <laughs> Derek, what's your story? Yeah, uh, basically, um, I've never ever been in an accident in my life. Oh, good for you. Um, in one respect, I mean, obviously, I've had a bit of damage done to the car in, in obviously supermarket car parks. You know, right? Little things like that. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Now, recently, I've been I've been getting sort of texting uh, on my phone. Yeah. Basically, I've been in an accident whiplash and all that we get compensation for you text back these these numbers i've just basically blanked them off in, in that sense no so hang on you've not had an accident you've not made an insurance claim no, no. one's made a claim against you no and you're getting tech they're, they're, not, <laughs> they're not even bothering to phone you up no they just leave they're just leaving on my sort of uh, obviously phone you know and uh so i don't know how they got my number i might have just been a, a sort of random calling or whatever <sighs> And uh, you, have you bothered to pursue this? Have you phoned these numbers to ask no, what's going on? No, no, no. Basically, um, I said when I did renew my car insurance this year, uh, it, it, the actual premium went right up. Yeah. And obviously, I did, I did change the insurance company, but they said because of all these claims are coming through, we had to cover our costs. So all, everyone else's claims are p- pushing your premium up? Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 didn't, it didn't go up by twenty pound. It went up by two hundred and twenty quid. And I'm, me. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm a fellow of 54 years of age, never claimed in my life, hardly drive the car, basically, because I you know, I, live, I work in a local school, so I walk to work a lot, and I just couldn't believe it, you know. I, it used to be, didn't it? If, if you know, if you were, were a good driver and didn't have accidents, then you could look forward to possibly getting a little cheeky reduction in the, the, the policy sometimes. Yeah. I, 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 it just astounded me how it jumped, you know, by that amount of money. Derek, can I ask you a question, and yeah. you can refuse to answer this if you so wish. OK. How much is your insurance policy a year? Uh, at the moment, it's 525 quid. 
Now, that was actually, the other choir I had was over £800. And that's fully com, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I say, and obviously, because I'm at a certain age, I've got to a certain sort of company. I'm not, I won't mention their name nope. or anything like that, you know. But th- that's to say that it's such a hike. Yeah. You know, um... Uh, Oh, it's just ridiculous, really. My insurance, I'm going to tell you this now. My insurance now, and this was after searching and, and looking around, my insurance is £1,060 a year. What are you driving? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm driving a, a polo. A six-year-old polo. You're joking. It's, 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 I tell you why, it's partly why, yes, I've got three points on my licence for speeding, I, I, I put my hands up, it was a long time ago, and they go off my licence next year, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Yes, I've made a claim in the last five years, right. and also it's partly because of my job. These, these companies, as soon as you say, you, you, I, can't, I can't apply for insurance online, because uh, as soon as I, I uh, put down a presenter, or a DJ, or, an, or a p- performer, or a comedian, or whatever, they say, oh, please call this number. And you call this number, and you can hear the person on the other end of the hand r- uh, line, rubbing their hands with glee yeah, yeah. because they think I'm going to be driving like Burt Reynolds or Paul McCartney around yeah, and yeah. if we have a if I have a crash with Paul McCartney and they could be liable for millions oh, yeah, yeah. I don't speak to Paul McCartney anymore these days we had a <laughs> we had a falling out quite a long time ago so yeah. it doesn't but so uh, and before that before I shopped around get this mm. my insurance on a polo was 1800 pounds oh, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable! So I can I can see, you know, I'm, I'm an exce- I'm, I'm an e- exception. I, 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 I put my hands up, but I can see why some people, your insurance, if it's gone up two, three hundred quid, why people could be tempted to think, well, I'm paying this much money, They're, I'm not, I'm getting nothing out of it. I might as well get a few quid back. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, but unfortunately, it's the culture we're living in. Yeah, it's just you know, money, money, money all, all the time, and you know, at the, at the moment, everybody's struggling because obviously, you know. Of course, sir. Uh, you know, that, that sort of environment. But uh, as I say, it's, well, you know, I suppose we're only human beings, folks. <laughs> Derek, thank you very much for that. 08459 four double five five double five. I remember sort of this, this culture coming over, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago? Because before, you didn't used to see adverts for no win, no fee. Give us a call. No win, no fee. Have you been involved in... Injured yourself at work? Give us a call. No win, no fee. And these kind of started about 15 years ago. It was an American thing, and it kind of, it kind of came over. And you would see the odd advert in a magazine or something. Now, daytime TV, full of these adverts. Have you broken, broken your arm whilst falling off a ladder? Then give us a call. No win, no fee. 08459 four double five five double five is our telephone number. Uh, let's go to Frank in Bedford. Hello, Frank. Good morning. What's your story, Frank? Well, it's a, it's, I'll listen to you, my friend. And um, first of all, I don't think you're being fair to the younger ones because ordering the age has got nothing to do with this. OK. You know, up to 20. For those who weren't listening, I, I did suggest that, that maybe people shouldn't be allowed to drive below the age of 20. Or, I think yeah, I said 21. No, I don't think that would work at all. OK. But what will work, and I, I can't see why it shouldn't work, yes. and that is, you, you know when you go for insurance... What do you want to claim for? You know, breakdown service, etc. Yeah. Well, why don't they add that on to if you want a whiplash, you pay more for it? Oh, I see. Because you can get, you can tick a box saying yes, I want windscreen cover or I want stere- my stereo covered and things like that, can't you? So yeah. you're saying you could add That's that. That's right. Now that would stop these crooks from uh, applying, or at least having pressure uh, putting on the innocent. And uh, it's, I've had it happen to me. Somebody ran in. I was in the car park. I wasn't even in the car. Yeah. And when I come out, the chap said to me, oh, sorry, my car has uh, run down the hill and bumped into your rear, ga- rear guard. So I had a look around. Hardly anything damaged to speak of. Anyway, he said, not to worry. He said, here's the details. Rub, rub, rub. <laughs> Go to this place and have it repaired. 650-odd pounds it was. Yeah. And, uh, oh, it was done beautifully, yeah. Wonderful. Made a nice new car of it, if you like, at the back. But yeah. anyway, I thought, that was ridiculous, that. Anyway, it was done. But when I went to renew my insurance, and I gave my name particulars, and a voice said, all full of innuendo, oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry, well, we can't insure you. And I thought, well, that's never happened to me before. Yeah. OK, well, they could have made an excuse, but I didn't give them the chance. I said, right, so how are you then? You know, that's that. <laughs> I like you, Frank, you're good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was that. Yes. Now then, the, I, then I saw or read somewhere that even though you uh, have not claimed, and I didn't make that claim, mm. uh, that was done for me by the, the opposing insurance company. Yes. No name. 
and it was all paid and done within, well, within a week. Wonderful. I, was, I thought, this is terrific service, but it wasn't necessary, in my opinion, not that much. Anyway, so the thing is this. They go to a hub, and then I read that you pay a little bit more if you aren't, even if you don't make the claim. They find out that a claim has been put against you, uh, or for you, or against, doesn't what? matter which, and they make you claim a bit more. Yes. Now, there's it's a fiddle going on somewhere. Yeah. Now, I do blame the insurance companies. I'll tell you for why. Yes. As you said earlier on, you can't talk to a person. No, you can't. It's a, it's a robot or a script. Exactly. Press this number, press that number, speak to a, well, a, a robot. <laughs> yes. So, consequently, whereas the days, years ago, they used to send an assessor out. You couldn't pull the wool over his eyes. They did used to send assessors out, didn't they? They did. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and therefore, you sh- that would stop a load of this nonsense. And if you remember, not too long ago, a load of crooks bought an old Volvo, and then they got hold of about five cars in the garage, and with that old Volvo, they went running around at two o'clock in the morning, banging into these cars in the this. garage. I do remember this, yeah. And then they put the claims in. Crash for cash. Remember? Yes, I do. I do remember this. Yes, yeah. yes. Big story. Yeah, it was. It wasn't given enough publicity, uh, so, though. Frank, so you, you were refused insurance by this company because someone had bumped into you when yeah. you hadn't even been in the car. Yeah. I've got to ask, had you been a naughty boy before? Do you have, you None know... None whatsoever. No, no claims? No. No points? No. Nothing? Yeah, I've got a speeding bound, yeah. so similar to you. There we go. That was years ago. Yes. And that's the only claim I've had since driving 1940. Now, Frank, listen, I'm going to say something that's controversial. <laughs> Think about it before you respond, OK? Go on. How old are you, Frank? Uh, 80, 87. OK. I'm going to say something. Yes, you are. You're too old to drive. Get off. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> but, you no, know, listen, I'm I'll sure... I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you to uh, driving with the skills if you want to over here. Are you talking a race? <laughs> no, <laughs> not a my polo? No, in and out, you know, the, the disc or whatever. Towing a caravan. I, I, Frank, I'm towing a caravan. <laughs> Surprisingly, I've never done that. Frank, I'm sure you're an excellent driver, but you would agree, wouldn't you, that there are some drivers of your age who are perhaps not as um, with it as they once were. Oh, I, I do understand that. OK, but why don't they give us a test, then? Do you not have to take a test when you get to 70 or something? No. I thought there was a thing that you had to take a test and you... No, were... only your eyesight. Right. OK. Oh, OK. That's all. Maybe they should, then. Maybe you get ah, to 70. I don't mind, yeah. You're up for it. That. He's a, Frank's up for a challenge. I like Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, listen, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you for calling in. All right, brother. Take care. Ta-ta. Bye now. He called me brother. I love Frank. Frank is... Uh, well, what a fantastic call. 08459 four double five five double five. I've been challenged by an 80-odd-year-old man. Thank you, Frank. Well done. Excellent work indeed. Have you made a claim? For Whiplash, have you had one of these companies phone you up uh, sometime after an accident and say, hey, listen, we know there's been an accident. We think you can probably get a grand, 1,500 quid. What is the going rate? If you have made a claim legitimately, how much did you get? Did it just cover the, the physio and the osteopathy and the medical expenses? Or was there, you know, a few quid compensation as well? Keen to know how much you got. 08459 four double five five double five. Every Monday to Saturday from 12, Nick Coffer. What's in it for you? Why, why should someone get involved? The spirit of adventure, also uh, job satisfaction. There was a nurse out there called uh, Josie Gilday. She called me into the therapeutic feeding centre one one afternoon and said, uh, I need a, a chair for one of our patients. Nick Coffer. And she was sat up, looking around, laughing, giggling in that chair. You can see the effect that you're having on, on the people around you. Nick Coffer, Monday to Saturday from 12 on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nick Coffer is on at uh, midday and he comes in um, sometime after 11 to have a little chat and tell us what he's up to today. And there's always some, some fantastic guests he has in there. He has a superb uh, list of guests. Let's go to Andrea in Kempston. Hello, Andrea. Good morning. Good morning. You're very perky. Everyone's very perky today, considering it's so miserable out there. Well, we've got to be, haven't we? It's the British weather. Exactly. That, that summer was nice. Let's move on with <laughs> autumn. Andrea, what's your story? Um, I had a, an accident a few, a couple of years ago, yeah. um, before the 421 was opened up in Bedford, coming along the, the new road. It's, uh, it was speed camera, average speed camera in her going along. Yeah. The woman in front of me pulled up to the roundabout and just, just, well, the woman in front of her, sorry, I should say, just stopped. Yeah. The woman in front of me pulled up and stopped. I didn't see, pulled oh. up, screeched, didn't hit her. Okay. Did oh. not hit her. 
the car behind me unfortunately did hit me though right, yeah. and pushed me into the lady in front uh cutting a long story short we all swapped details the lady at the front was absolutely fine um everyone was absolutely fine um the, the guy in the car behind me had a, a young baby in the car as did i um, I got home, did the usual, put it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it was, and uh, saying about it. And one of my ex-policeman friends phoned me up and said, are you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. No, 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 are you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Why? And he said, well, are you not going to put in a claim for compensation? And it's like, I'm afraid I'm very much of the, um, the philosophy that you do as you, treat, that you, as you wish to be done to you and, yeah. and you treat as you wish to be treated. And I'm afraid I wouldn't do it out of principle, if something had been, you know, if one of the kids had got hurt or I'd got hurt, then yes, possibly I would have done. However, there was no, there was, you know, there was a little bit of metal crumpled, but, you know, other than that, everyone was absolutely fine. I just wouldn't do it. But I keep getting now, because of that, I keep getting, um, you know, you can claim £4,000 for an accident you've had, uh, and, you know, weekly I get them. Hang on a second, There's, there are so many parts of this that are fascinating. Your friend was an ex-copper? Yes. And yes. he suggested that you do that? He did. He did, and he was a Met police officer as well. That's incredible. I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, they kind of d- 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 know the, the, the little things, the little bends in the law that you can get away with, but that seems incredible. What was his reaction when you told him you weren't going to be doing that? He said, but they would do it to you, and I said, well, that's, their, that's on their conscience. I can sleep comfortable in my bed knowing that I haven't made a false claim, because besides the fact that if I get caught doing a false claim, it's prison, isn't it? So it's like, what's the point in it for a couple of grand? I, I, I am so naive because the first few times a couple of these companies phone me up and they're going, are you injured? No, no, I'm fine. No, but seriously, are you injured? No, no, I'm fine, thank you. And I genuinely thought they were being concerned about me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was the case. But then, um, uh, and you, you keep getting these messages. Are they texts or are they phone calls? I get texts. I get texts. I mean, we, what we have, texts. what we've decided we're going to do now is we reply yes to them and then wait until they phone and say, where have you got our information from? Mm. But the only thing I can put it down to is, um, at the moment, we uh, have been phoning around for insurance, and I'm assuming that somewhere on the database, it's sort of it's re-dragged this accident up. Um, and, of course, they're now, you know, sort of because it's come active again, they're now looking into it, and this is the reason we're getting so many of them. But well, we had, we had a call from, from someone who said that, that her insurance company said that they're all put on a computer. All the accidents are put on a computer. And then these companies are sort of allowed to go and trawl through that. I would have said that's under the Data Protection Act. I would have said that that's, uh, that's uh, somewhat illegal. You know you know that somewhere, Andrea, you have not ticked a box uh, that's, that keeps your information don't you private. Just, don't you just? Those boxes online are the most good. If you do wish people to not have this information and therefore they can't see it but you would like them to, then do not untick this box. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, Andrea, but it's nice. It's, it's, uh, listen, I admire you for that. Thank you very much. I think I'm the same. I'm, I, I, on, on principle, maybe when I was younger and a little bit more, more carefree, but on principle, I don't think I could do this uh, and make an, an illegitimate claim for injury. I don't think I could do it because I'm going to say something really naive and stupid. It's not fair. Is it? It's not fair. And I, I'm, you know, I think maybe it's now because I've got kids, and now I've got kids, I'm trying to bring them up uh, to, to, to treat people in the world, you know, as, as I would want my children treated. And I'm, I'm trying to tr- te- teach them to be honest as, as much as I can be. I'm flawed, but trying to teach them to be honest. And I don't think I could do something like that. It's funny how having kids changes, <laughs> changes your entire perspective on life. 08459 455 555. Pat in Hemel. Hello, Pat. Oh, hello. Hello, Pat. You had an accident a couple of years ago. I did. What happened? Well, I was visiting a friend, came out of a concealed entrance in a a hill. Yeah. Uh, it's on a, quite a steep hill, which people speed up. Mm. It's a 30 mile an hour, but my friend said there's been lots of accidents there and people speeding. And um, I was edging out. One minute this woman wasn't, plus the fact there's a bit of a bend in the road, and she wasn't, she wasn't in sight when I was pulling out. Yeah. And I then thought, well, it's clear I'll pull out, so I hit her. Um, we, I backed into the my friend's drive, and a fella came and helped her because she was panicking. But in actual fact, she was absolutely fine. Yeah. She was. Yeah, we were both shocked a little bit and upset. 
It is upsetting, isn't it? It's it strange. I've been in a few crashes, my fault and other people's fault. And it is, it, 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 it's quite an emotional thing. It, there, it is very much so. Yeah. But we swapped insurances. There's one thing, I cannot fault my insurance. They were excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, then over a year later, when I thought, oh, it's all done and dusted, over a year, they phoned me to say that she was claiming and asked me questions. And it was my company because I said, I'm not going to speak to you unless you write me a letter because I don't give any information out over the phone. They wrote me a letter and gave me a number. Again, this is my insurance company, so I can't fault them. But she was claiming personal injury. Now, she was absolutely fine. After My friend took us in and we had a cup of tea and talked and she was laughing and joking, no problem. And then I got this. My insurance went up £100. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. But, and they said I'd had two claims. You know, I hadn't in years and years and years. Yeah. So what were the two claims from this accident? One claim was for her car and my car. Right. The other other claim was for her. So so it counts as two separate claims. It's not tagged on as, as one big claim. No. Well, we, we have heard from people today who said that they've uh, suffered the effects of whiplash maybe two weeks after the incident. I, and I, I, I don't want to cast any doubt on what that gentleman said, because I'm sure it's absolutely true. I am surprised by that, that it can have such a delayed reaction mm. to it. And I understood years ago, when my friend had an accident, that mm. you had to go to the hospital that day or within 24 hours to be checked out, otherwise you can't claim. I, well, you don't have to do that now. That, that's, that's completely changed. And maybe that's what we need to bring back in, something like that. I mean, the, the, they oh, are... Oh, absolutely. They are talking of, of, instead of you having to go to the GP and getting it signed off, and we all know GPs will sign anything off because they're busy. It's not a criticism of them at all. They've got more important things mm. to deal with. That mm. Instead of doing that, you go and see an independent doctor or physiotherapist and they'll kind of look at you and test you and, and stuff like that. Is that enough of a of a change in the law around this or do we need more do you think i think we need more to stop these claims because there's so many adverts on the television have you had an accident you could earn you could get so much compensation and all this and it's you know people are conning the insurance companies and it's putting all our our premiums up Pat, okay if you if you have legitimately hurt yourself though is it okay to claim on that yeah Oh, yeah, if they've been... And if they get checked out and they have legitimate... Yeah, well, that's what you pay the extra for, for the, um, sort of public liability. And I don't... I, if I can avoid paying anything... But claiming anything on insurance, I don't claim on my house insurance. If I break... break broke my computer the other day, I could have claimed it on the house insurance, but I know that my premium would have gone up three 300 quid if I'd done that. Oh, absolutely. Might as well go and buy another computer. Yeah, and I do the same. I don't claim on the house insurance and everything. Pat, listen, thank you very much. Um, let's go to Marion in Stevenage. Good morning, Marion. Good morning. Um, just a query. Yes. What do you actually put down as your, um, when you ring up the uh, agency and ask them? What On my actually... car insurance. I think yeah. I am now, I think I'm a broadcaster, I think. N- no, 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 you're no. A, you're a media engineer. <laughs> but... <laughs> But, but Marion, that's a lie, isn't it? No, you, 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 you're on the media. Yes. But you play with your, your sliders up and down. I do. Can so you see? You, you engineer, you, you're a media engineer. But the thing is, because mm. um, sometimes uh, I have... Well, if you, if you do daft things, then obviously you're going to get caught up. But then <laughs> you say, no, I'm not saying daft if, things. But, but listen, if you're going to... If you're going to... I mean, you can try it. The thing is, you try it, and then if they find out that I'm not a media engineer... because well, I you don't, are. You are. In, um, you're on the media. You're so dodgy, on you? And well, well, we had to do it once upon a time because we were entertainers also. Oh, really? We were, we were, yeah. We're, we're well, now printers. We don't do so much entertainment. What, what entertainment did you do, Marion? Magic. Man, uh, we, 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 were totally stuck, we were stuck in the same thing. Are you a magician's assistant? Mm, no, I'm a magician. Oh, a lady uh, magician! Uh, wow, yeah. I didn't know that was allowed these days. Oh yeah, don't worry. I love a bit of magic. What's your best trick? Mm, make the cards match. Oh, anyway, <laughs> anyone can do that. That's well easy. So, do you think that Terry Wogan could get away with saying he was a media engineer? Well, he he, he, he was famous. Are you famous? 
I have I have a slight notoriety. Oh, right. But, I mean, have you tried all the companies? I've tried all of the companies. Well, tr- <laughs> I've tried them all. Try- well, just try it. Oh, well, I, 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 Marion, I couldn't do anything so naughty. I, I have to be honest on these uh, these things. Adam's in Bedford. Hello, Adam. How you doing? You all right? I'm, I'm all right, thank you. I'm, I'm considering whether I could put down media engine. I don't think I could. I think... Uh, no, no, you've got to be so careful now, because I, I run up for a car quote, and I hadn't changed my occupation... And my insurance went up by thirty pound when when they saw that with my previous um, my van wasn't the same occupation as I was trying to get from my car. Like they clocked it straight away. You have to be so careful filling in these forms because yeah. they are always looking for a little loophole to yeah. say, "Ah, well, you didn't do this, so that's, we can't pay." It. You've got to be very very careful and very honest, of course. Adam, what's what's your story on this? Well, I've had two accidents within in the space of two years. This yeah. was seven years ago, which I've rung up before about. Um, the first one I. Um, fractured two vertebrae, crushed, uh, crushed my, crushed my vertebrae as well. Oh my goodness! Um, I got all sorted. Um, didn't get a lot of help with that accident um, because the driver drove away and oh. they got them. So, but then seven months later, I got knocked off my motorbike. Um, I stopped at a T junction. The lady didn't, um, wasn't concentrating, um, and like I had my personal protection on um, my insurance. Mm. So, like, the solicitors wrote to me, and then their, their, the other insurance company tried to say to me, look, we want to settle with you, want to settle with you, like, we know you're not very well with your neck and all that. But my legal cover, they said, no, we're sending you straight into an independent doctor of our choice. Yeah. Um, and they put me in for that. They said straight away, yep, this is what's wrong with you. Six months of physio I had to have. Um, went through a lot of troubles with it, like I had to have a day off a week um, from my job. So I lost a lot of money out of it. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, mean, I got, I got eight thousand pounds from it, um, but I, I lost a lot as well, which people don't realise. But what my point is, the legal cover is really good in in a sense because you've got that protection then from the solicitors, and they they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They couldn't do enough for you, mm. and um, you know. But they do say to you, you know, the money you get, you must keep some aside because in the last six years, I've had to have at least a hundred pound a year on treatment on loosening my neck back up. Yeah. Which is, like acupuncture, physio, etc., and I'm still having that now to this day, and that's six, seven years ago. Wow. Um, like, you know, you, you, people are doing it, and they're getting away with it, and I'll, I'll be 100% honest with you now, my sister has done it. She has claimed when she didn't need to She's claim. done a little hooky, naughty claim? She did. Her and her friend done it, yeah. And um, I was I was devastated, because, I mean, like I say, I, I, I've basically broke my back yeah. seven years ago, and can get no help, and then there's people out there just claiming, like, and getting away with it. Adam, okay. listen, I've got to move on because we're out of time, but thank you very much for that. You do wonder, though, if people stop making these claims, and so it didn't cost the insurance company so much money, would they actually give us any money back? Nah. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking to uh, Sarah from Hertfordshire, who found an effective way of dealing with antisocial behaviour. It's going to be a fascinating story. Love to hear your views as well. Speak to you after the latest news. It's the JVS Show with me, Ian Lee, standing in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith. After 11, I'll be looking at your consumer problems, and I'll be talking to Leisha. A few months ago, Leisha had a sewage problem in her housing association flat. The toilet was blocked. She tried to sort it out, but had to call the housing association. In the end, they sent out a drainage person to come and try and unblock it. He actually made the problem worse, where it started to flow into my bath. Raw sewage coming up into your bath? Yeah, literally, other people's sewage, feces, tissues, you know, the lot, anything you could think of. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? All of this has ruined Leisha's flooring and bath mats, along with all the towels it took to clean up. There's an estimated cost of nearly £1,000 to replace everything. But in this hour of the programme, is there an effective way of dealing with antisocial behaviour? There's been a lot about antisocial behaviour in the news over the last couple of weeks, and Jonathan did a programme about it recently. Well, Sarah from Hertfordshire was listening that day... And after what she describes as two and a half years of hell, she's finally managed to change things on her street, but she's needed the backing of her neighbours to do it. Hear her story, and if you have anything to say on this, I would love to hear it. Uh, is there an effective way of dealing with antisocial behaviour? 08459 455 555. The JVS Show. Surprising stories that you won't hear anywhere else. The JVS Show. On BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Good morning, this is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith as he's away on his holiday, and um, I, well, I'm getting by. I think I'm getting by. Now, do you feel naughty if you use plastic bags? Despite pressure from David Cameron to make us cut down on the number of plastic bags we use, official figures show around 350 million more bags were given out by retailers over the past year. Last year, the Prime Minister asked stores to hand out fewer bags, but it seems that no one is listening. So, are we just not bothered about our plastic bag consumption? Do you feel naughty if you use plastic bags? But first... Is there an effective way of dealing with antisocial behaviour? At the end of last month, Jonathan did a programme about antisocial behaviour. It was after some residents on a housing estate in Luton contacted the programme. They say they've suffered years of antisocial behaviour. Reporter Ben went to meet three of them who didn't want to be named. They say the problem started when new neighbours moved in. Sadly, they seem to be suffering from a lot of alcohol-related problems or drug-related problems. This causes a great deal of antisocial behaviour and therefore that affects our day-to-day life drastically. Um, we have many, many sleepless nights. I'm sat here in your front room and we're looking out the window. What kind of antisocial behaviour are you seeing? We do see an awful lot of people who tend to come up. They often are, uh, seem to be alcohol-infused or whatever. Um, we can actually see them sometimes kicking main entrance doors. We can see them throwing stones at windows. And the language and the verbal abuse that comes across um, is horrendous. Do you feel safe here? Um, sometimes we don't feel safe. Um, you know, we've had an awful lot of incidents which have been quite scary. Um, you know, we've seen fighting, things like that. And it, it is very scary, it is very frightening. But particularly for some of the older people who are here. If you say anything to them, like, you can't even be standing looking out the window and it's, oh, look at that nosy boot boot, you know, and this and that. You shouldn't have to put up with that. You should be able to sit on your balcony, go out and look out your window, not have, you know, mental abuse and physical abuse like they've had. We do sometimes worry if we come back and actually our home is safe or if it's going to be broken into or... You know, we, we actually don't know sometimes what we're going to expect. It's very stressful. And I can't even have my French doors open because the smell of the drugs. So I've got to keep the windows closed all the while. You can smell the drugs. Yeah, I'll you can actually smell, smell the drugs. That's how strong it is because there's so many people around you who smoke it in the flat. Yeah. They sit on their balcony smoking it and it just, the air just takes it into your flat. So you've got to keep your doors closed. Yeah. You can't sit in peace because they're always drinking and shouting. Um, you can't have your dinner in peace because of the smell. Um, you can't watch your TV because of the noise. Um, and you can't go to sleep. You go to sleep at night and there's noise again. You know, they've just got no respect. Well, one thing that came out of the interview was that residents were worried about the repercussions if those responsible found out they were making complaints. One woman who was listening that day is Sarah from Hertfordshire. She says it's vital that locals get together to fight this, and she's joining me in the studio this morning. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Oh, I tell you what, should I turn your microphone on? Morning. Yeah, that's better. Uh, this, this, tell us what was happening. Tell us the kind of behaviour that you were experiencing. We had race hate crime, we had arson, we had rocks at properties, verbal abuse, harassment. Oh um, there was a lot. It was a lot. And I witnessed quite a lot of it. And then I, I ended up being a witness for a court case. And then I started to get targeted myself. So this wasn't just little kids, sp- you know, doing graffiti, which is bad enough. You know, people writing and painting on walls and stuff is bad enough. But pff, you can kind of live it. This was actual nasty... They were anything from the ages of 13 to 19, and they weren't in groups of one and twos. They were in groups of seven, eights, nines, even up to 14. So they they went around. It was a pack mentality. And what kind of street do you live in? Is it a nice street? It's a nice street. The majority of the householders are are pensioners. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, it, it is a nice street, or was a nice street, but we're now bringing it back to being back to how it was we'll get to that in a minute because your story is amazing of, of, of how you tackled this situation and what you did with it how often were these events taking place nightly nightly and at weekends it would step up a level so we'd get it during the day we'd get it at night soon as it, for me since christmas up until perhaps the middle of last month i phoned the police 28 times just for my household alone and were these 999 calls, or were you calling the local couple station? Of, or? A couple of them were 999s, um, but mostly on the 101 number. Right, OK. 
And when you phoned the 999, what did, what did they say? Did they take it seriously or did they say, come on now? No, no, they, they, they came out. Yeah. Um, they were th- like on the scene within a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, no, they, they took away the evidence. Um, yes, they did t- treat, it, treat it seriously. But so you've got a group of kids, in, and I, I would say that if you're 16 and over, you're not a kid. No, you, you can go. You can go and join the army and kill people. You're you're a grown up. What well, <laughs> precisely? Yeah. Uh, but the knockdown for, for me, it was um, it was a grown up version of knockdown ginger that I was uh, being at eleven o'clock at night. I'd get my doors smacked on, the windows smacked on, walking down the side of the property, smacking on that, and then you know I'd just, I'd go out, and then it'd be like a cat and mouse situation. You know, oh she's out, she's going to phone the police, then the police would turn up, and then the police would chase them around the streets. It was like a Keystone Cop situation. <laughs> And so that was the kind of the main thing that you were dealing with personally. Kids personally, banging yeah. on the doors, banging on the windows. And stones, right. stones. A lot of people would say, just ignore it. Just ignore it and they'll get bored and go somewhere else. No, because I couldn't afford to replace windows. Right, they were breaking windows. They hadn't, but I mean, I don't have double glazing. Right. So had I been subjected to that, plus I had my garage broken into uh, twice in a spate of about seven days. Um, and just watching them throwing rocks at my property. And as to what they'd done to, to my neighbour down the road, that, that was race hate. Really? And I, I was a witness for that. See, so. that takes it into a whole different yeah, sphere. Yeah, it's, it's race hate and harassment. And the arson, who, who was affected by the arson? Uh, that was another neighbour down, down the road and graffiti. Um, it, was, it was horrible. It was beginning, it was turning into a no-go zone. And even to a point that my children would be subjected to it. And even when I came out of the property, I would be verbally abused to a point that it, it was really distressful. Six weeks ago, I couldn't have been sat here having this conversation with you without mm. bursting into tears. Did you recognise these kids? I knew all of them. Really? You knew them? Yes. You knew their families? I uh, didn't know their families, but I knew who the children were. What kind of families did they come from? Uh, some were mortgage payers yeah. in, in households, yeah. and some a majority of them were um, local authority tenants. And you can't... I mean, when I was a kid, if I don't think naughty, someone would come out and say, Oh, I know your parents. I'll tell your parents. That, that didn't have any... No, no, because they would go, yeah, yeah, bring it on. And it's just like, well, I'm, I'm not feeding into that, that kind of behaviour, thanks very much. Six, you say that six weeks ago you couldn't have come in without crying. No, I was, I, I was sleepless nights. I was scared to go out of the house. I would have... I still do now to an extent because one of them got hold of my son's mobile number mm. and it was the threats of your mum had better watch out where she's going otherwise she's going to get a brick over the back of the head. So, That's and that, nice. that, was, that was fearful. Yeah. And the last, the last time that I had to phone 999, a brick was launched at, um, at my property. It hit my back step and had I been doing the, the last bin run for the evening, I wouldn't be here to have a conversation with you today well so i i, I kind of know where we're going with this story and what you did is, is i think fantastic and is an inspiration uh this is Ian Lee filling in for jvs We've got sarah in hertfordshire with us we are asking is there an effective way to deal with antisocial behavior if if anything that you're hearing now has kind of happened to you or you've seen it happen uh you can give us a call oh eight four five nine four double five five double five what happened to you and and how did you deal with it really keen to get your stories on this this is ian lee filling in for jvs oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number you can text eight one three double three start your text three cr we're asking is there an effective way to deal with antisocial behavior before we get back to sarah from hertfordshire i must tell you this that next saturday the olympic torch finally gets to the three counties it makes its way from waltham cross to hartford and we are going to be there the torch also visits Ware and bishop stortford and we'll be following it we'll also be bringing you the sights and sounds from the luton international mella we are your olympic station bbc three counties radio my first stint doing breakfast i start doing breakfast next week for a few weeks is out and about with the uh, with the olympic torch i'm quite excited about that but before that uh, Sarah from Hertfordshire is telling us about the antisocial behaviour you're getting from little so-and-sos aged between, what, 14 to 19?
scene. Yeah. Big groups of them. There was not just your graffiti and your vandalism. There was arson. There were rocks being thrown. You were getting violent threats because they got your son's mobile, mobile number. Did they go to school with any of your kids? Did your, no. did your kids know No, I, I, I sent my children out of the area. Right, OK. So I don't know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. But they, they'd not necessarily been to, to primary with them, but they'd probably been at the local skate park with yeah. them or they, they knew my children. Yeah. So... Uh, and you got the police around. You phoned the police, what did you say, 28 times? 28 times. And what did they do? They just come and... Well, n- nine times out of ten. The, the, the thing is, it, the, the more that you log it between your, your community or within your street, for every URN number... That is That's the a, criminal number. Yeah, yeah. the unique, um, unique registered number for, for that crime for the day. Yeah. It, it, brings, it, it brings your street into a hotspot. Right, OK. And then when the police bring that up on their stats, it's like, oh, wow, you know, what's happening in this street? Station then, Road is, uh, there's yeah. something going on there. It's not so, Station Road, is it? I'd be no, terrible no, if I made up a name and it was the right one. <laughs> no. How awful would that be? Uh, so th- they came and they, they, they took it seriously. Did the, they keep taking it seriously? Or was there a point when they kind of went, look, there's nothing we can do. I I went to um, a community safety partnership meeting, which um, I think every local authority has. They have them every quarter. Right. And that's where you go and discuss what is happening within your community. So um, off I trotted, took a couple of the residents with me and said, you know, if we've got to do this, we've all got to do it together. Mm. And we all need to be, keep going to these meetings, keep logging it with the police. And in the end, they're going to start taking notice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had a new chief inspector. And um, I, I kind of put him on the spot uh, in, in a big forum. And then after the meeting, he took me to one side and he, did, he started to take it seriously. So how long had it been from the first incident to that meeting where the new chief inspector started? About 18 months. Wow. That's such a long time. It is. And you weren't getting any sleep? Weren't getting any sleep. Constant, no. gone late, late at night. I'm I, I was well. becoming the night watchman in, in my house. I would be in the living room. I'd be in the kitchen. I would be upstairs. I'd be back in the kitchen because you could hear what was going on. Yeah, and that would draw attention to to their activities. So then you would end up witnessing what they were doing. Did you ever consider moving out? I can't afford to move. Right. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm in a catch-22 situation with a property that is a bit of a noose around my neck. Right. But, uh, no, I couldn't afford to move. Would you have moved if you could? I could have, yeah. You'd have got quite out? Quite happily. I did the lottery every week, <laughs> praying for six numbers. Oh, God. And so I'm guessing you felt like a prisoner in your own home then, that, that after a certain time, when it got dark, you kind of had to lock up You're the doors sorry. and that was it? Come, be, when the nights were drawing in... Coming to that five o'clock situation, it would be, you know, what, what's going to happen this evening? Who's going to be targeted tonight? What's going to be thrown at the property? And it, it would get, even get to a point that when I turned over the calendar, I would think, oh, look at that. You've got the month of April. It's absolutely clear. Mm. I do not want to litter it with URN numbers. Yeah. And lo and behold, it would be... Did you ever talk to any of these kids? Did you ever go out and say, come on, what are you doing? We had a local, uh, our local town councillor got involved and he went out and asked them what they wanted and, you know, why are you doing it? Why are you behaving in such a way? We're bored. We've got nothing to do. And um, they, they gave them ideas as to, you know, what's coming up within the community, what things are, are being built and what activities they can take part yeah. in. Um, he, he's, he, he has been... Um, He's been very forthright with them. But again, you know, it's, it's an adult. Who cares? Yeah. Really? And also kids. I remember being a kid and people say, hey, go, let's go to... You should go... You kids should go to the youth centre. You know... You do, well, youth clubs don't exist those anymore. Those things do are kind of put on by the council. You can... Kids kind of rebel against anyway. They don't want anything to do with that. No. Really. I think just go and read, go and read a book. Go, you bored? Go and read a book. For, you got play? Go and play PlayStation. You got all these things to do these days. There's go. more. There's more for kids now than there ever was for me growing up in the seventies and the eighties. Why? Although you had the basic rollers. Why? I don't know if that was a good or a bad thing. I'm Why sure were they picking your street? What was it? Was it specifically your street, or were they kind of going around the area from different places? No, it was. It was specific. It was. It was mainly our street. Why? Is it because they were getting a reaction from you? I think you? it was. I think it was. And then it got to a point that I, I would have to say to... When I phoned up the, on, on the 101 number, they'd say, oh, you know, we need somebody to come out and attend. And I used to beg them, please, please, do not send a police car. Do not send PCSOs. Why? I do not want you parking outside my property. I do not want the, um, them to see you coming into my property. Because it seemed to heighten it. 
So they cars. would they would see a car pull up outside yeah. your house and they'd be watching from a distance and go, right, we're going to get her. Yeah. She's had the, the, the temerity to call, call the police. I don't know if temerity is a word. I think I mean tenacity. Anyway. It must have been terrifying. must have been horrible. A lot of elderly people in your street as well. What were they thinking? They must have just been feeling I th- I rotten. The, I mean, bless them. They, they didn't want... For, for the other families that I, I did manage to get involved and said, look, you know, as a community, we've got to do this all together. Mm. Our, elderly, our elderly residents were, you know, you know, I don't want to draw attention to myself. Yes, it is annoying, but, you know, not, I, I can't hear it or Bert can't hear it because of his hearing. And, you know, they would be, you know, the majority of the time we'll go and live in the, the living room and that way we don't have to, you know, draw our curtains right. and then that would, be, that, would, that would be an end to it. Yeah. But um, I'd eventually, after getting a, an appointment with um, the, the local chief constable, and he came up with a, um, a it, it, it's, it's for absolute extreme situations and they started to work with the local authority mm. for an exclusion and curfew order for our street. We'll stop there because this is, this is where it starts getting really interesting about how you, you kind of, as a team, with working with the police and with your neighbours, you kind of took control of the situation and implemented something that made a real change. We are asking, is there an effective way to deal with antisocial behaviour? And uh, you're hearing Sarah's story. It would be great to hear yours as well. 08459 455 555. Maybe it's something that you've dealt with. Maybe you've moved because of it. It was just so bad. And you were in a position where you thought, you know what? I don't need this. I'm going to move somewhere else. Maybe you're going through it now. Maybe you're getting sleepless nights and you're worried and you're frightened because of the horrible little people that are out in your street all hours of the night causing problems. Give us a call 08459 455 555. There we go, Christopher. This is Ian Lee filling in for uh, Jonathan Vernon Smith on BBC Three Counties Radio. We're asking, uh, is there an effective way to deal with antisocial behaviour? 08459 455 555. Uh, we've got an amazing story of Star- Sarah from Hertfordshire who has come up with a solution w- with all of her neighbours and the police. They've come up with a, a solution to antisocial behaviour. We'll hear what that is after the latest travel news. On FM, AM and online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh, if you could see some of the things that go on in this studio, you would be uh, absolutely amazed. This is Ian Lee filling in just for Jonathan Vernon-Smith. Is there an effective way to deal with antisocial behaviour? I'm talking to Sarah from Hertfordshire. Sarah, we've heard uh, that you were being plagued by um, kids, groups as big as 14, 15, teenagers. Uh, There was arson, there was race hatred, there was uh, aggression and violence, there was vandalism, there were all of these things. You called the police out 28 times. It was kind of a hopeless situation. Then you got together with the new chief inspector. Yes, it did. What happened? What was the plan you came up with? Well, the, the community safety partnership meetings um, with our local council, um, they, they highlight anything from uh, burglary, car theft, and ASB was one of them. So he, deci- he said that he was very hot on all of this, and I decided to, to uh, make him stand up to his claim yeah. and um, I, in an open forum I asked him what he planned on doing with our situation and he asked to speak to me after the meeting and um, along with the local town council councillor went to a meeting with him and he came up with a, a, an idea that hadn't been hadn't been used within the street and it, it was a case of do you know what we're gonna we're gonna have to go with it i will try we, anything that's exactly it so what it was a curfew it was a curfew it's a cur- uh, dispersal and curfew order dispersal and curfew order what how does it work what are the, what are the rules there are boundaries it's quite it's, it, it's quite a tight boundary but it encompasses our road and neighboring roads so as so if you if you disperse or um, send said youth back to parent and then they came come back to that street or the next street they can't so it kind okay. of makes their 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 movement quite, quite and what, what are the rules what are the rules of when the police can come and get involved uh five or more four or more after 9 p.m yeah then if they're 16 and under they are taken back to their parents they get in the police car and they get taken yeah. back and 16 and over they're dispersed they're asked to move on so but they could just move to the boundary they could just move to the boundary and then i suppose that that would make it um a a lot difficult but it's I, i would like to say that it has worked yeah to a point that 
we can still get collection of views in the street and as soon as they see a police car they they they, they disperse themselves right and um, do they because do they have any respect for the police are they not just no, standing there flicking no, the v's and yeah that's exactly it no respect whatsoever but Cat and mouse. It was like Keystone Cops watching it. It was quite pitiful. How um, long has the curfew been in place? That came into place April, just before the school holidays, okay. thankfully, the Easter holidays, and that stays in place throughout the six-week summer holidays and ends the either the first or second week of September. Is it working? Is it being effective? Along with that and the police working with the local authority. Yeah. So the local authority are now p- going to start dishing out i suppose asbos yeah. to to those parents whose children misbehave mm. so we've, we've got that other everybody is now finally finally talking to each other yeah. you've got the police talking to the local authority you've got the local authority talking to the residents and the residents reporting everything back to the police so you've got a triangle of people or communicating, which put wasn't your, happening. Put your headphones on. We've got a caller. We've got um, Raj in Bedford. Hello, Raj. Hi there, Ian. What, what, what do you think about all this? Well, um, all I have to say is, um, I mean, I've had a few uh, situations with uh, antisocial behaviour with teenagers, and uh, the problem, I think, is, like I say, I think the parents should be responsible for where their child is at whatever certain time, and they should be responsible for the, uh, the child's action. Um, I think... Look, if, if the schools can hold the parents responsible if the child is truanting or misbehaving, and if we can hold uh, animal owners such as dogs uh, and their behaviour, and we, we sort of like subjugate the, the owner, why can we not sort of like say to the parents, right, you're responsible for your child's behaviour, where, where they are and what they're up to, up to a certain point. I understand once they reach a certain age that they're responsible, but I have an 18-year-old son, and yeah. God... God help him, if somebody comes around my house and says, my son has been involved in sort of antisocial behaviour or he's being disrespectful to one of my neighbours or anybody. Roger, and, that, 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 and uh, you know, that sounds like you're doing good parenting, but you, it's hard to tell a 16-year-old what to do. No, I, I, I fully understand that because they are in a, in a time of their life where they're sort of like experimenting and they have a lot of peer pressure. But at the same time, I would also suggest to parents that you need to know what your 16-year-old is up to. Now, I'm not saying you, you lock him up or you, you, know, you, you do something horrible and nasty. It's not about that. But it's about you know, sitting them down and trying to install some of the old value respect that we used to have for our elder generation and other people who live around us because it's up to them to make their neighbourhood a safe and healthy environment for the you know, young and up-and-coming. And if we can install them that, look, if they are setting uh, a track for the younger generation to look at, maybe we can slowly, steadily help them move on to better and brighter futures. Raj, I'm not necessarily disagreeing you, with you, but what if the parents don't care? Or if they're out at work all the hours and so the kids are at home on their own, what, what, what then, what, you know? Well, I mean, in my view, like I say, um, there's, there's a reason why we have the problem we have today. And I think personally it's because we have a lot of selfish, and I have to say selfish, parents, i.e. one being too young having children, or B, unfortunately, and I don't mean it in a, in a disrespectful way, there are too many single parents who, like you say, they have to work, and I fully understand. But at the same time, when you're a parent, you have to take in that there is a responsibility to that child. And sometimes, you know, to gain something, you have to lose something. Now, by, by yourself going out and making ends meet, which I fully do understand, because, like I say, you know, it's not easy... Um, but at the same time, you have to understand that, that letting the child go and do what he wants to do or she wants to do, you're not really helping them to sort of like better themselves for the future. Raj, listen, uh, thank you very much for that. It's hard, though, isn't it? Because kids, the kids don't listen all the time. Some parents aren't very good parents. Off, off the back of what Raj was just saying, um, he's, he also pointed out uh, with regards to... I mean, I'm, I'm a single mum. Um, I, I was um, um, working full time. Uh, the children were at home on their own, or they were with. Um, fortunately, I, I had my, my parents locally, yeah. and under no circumstances, I would be absolutely mortified had had the police ever yeah. ever have turned up to my property. I mean, there was always a veiled threat as yeah. to what would happen should they ever come home armed with the police. But um, no, I, I, I'm. 
I'm inclined to agree with with, with what I've oh, I'm, I Oh, I agree with a lot of it. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I'm a parent, and I, I think I do a pretty good job telling my boy what's right and what's wrong. It sounds like you do the same with your kids, but not all, that par- not all parents are good. Not all parents really no, care that much. No, and then much. I suppose off of the back of what we're doing, um, the, the local authority are starting to say, look, you, your child, you, you live in a local authority house, mm. you are responsible for the behaviour of your child, if you don't start taking responsibility for for, for your kids, then you're going to risk losing your property, mm. which is what is is now. Sarah, listen. It sounds like you've been through a nightmare. I wish you the very best of luck Thank with you. it. I hope this Thank curfew works. Goodness. And it sounds like uh, you know th- th- it's making progress and. <sighs> It's tough, isn't it? Let, keep in touch. Let us know how this goes on. Because, thanks, um, yeah, thank you very much. Best of luck. OK. Well, uh, oh, we're talking plastic bags after this. Good morning. This is Ian Lee filling in for JVS. We've got the Consumer Hour coming up at 11 o'clock, which is always very exciting. But first, next Sunday, the Olympic Torch continues its journey across the three counties. It's an early start in Bedford as it make, makes its way onto Cotton End and then to Letchworth Garden City. From Stevenage, it goes on to Welling Garden City and Hatfield. After St Albans, it travels through Hemel Hempstead and on to Luton. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll also be bringing you the sights and sounds from the Luton International Carnival. And every step of the way, we will be there. We are your Olympic station, BBC Three Counties Radio. And I said, I'm, I'm filling in for Jonathan for a week. He will be back next Monday. Don't panic, dear listener. But then I, f- I, I cover breakfast for, I think, three or four weeks. I'm not quite sure. And I'm really looking forward to it. My first broadcast is going to be uh, watching the, uh, the Olympic torch being, being uh, carried along. I'm very excited. I'm nervous because it's a really important thing. And there's obviously a lot of local pride in this. And I don't want to mess it up. It's a big thing to get wrong. But I've, I've been told I've been given the, uh, the, the superb A team who are going to come and sit along with me and uh, are, uh, are going to um, make sure I don't do anything wrong. So fingers crossed on that. Now, do you feel naughty if uh, you use plastic bags? Despite pressure from David Cameron to make us cut down on the number of plastic bags we use, official figures show around 350 million more bags were given out by retailers over the past year. Last year, the Prime Minister asked stores to hand out fewer bags, but it seems that no one is listening. So are we just not bothered about our plastic bag consumption? Do you feel naughty if you use plastic bags? You know when you go into the shop and... Could I have a plastic bag, please? Do you feel bad doing that? Do you feel guilty at all? Joining me in the studio is Professor Chris Coggins, a resource and waste consultant based in Luton. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Just going to move this ever so slightly closer to you, sir. That's my fault. There you go. I thought we were using less plastic bags, but well, that's not the case. I think it is the case that a few years ago the government and the retailers combined and agreed to reduce the sale of plastic, the, 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 the giving out of plastic bags. Yep. Some retailers started doing it. In Wales, they introduced legislation that made a, a charge of five pence for each bag that people wanted. And some of the shops do that in the UK. And some of yep. the shops do that in, in the mall. Some still do, yep. some don't. And I think at the end of the day, uh, retailers, they've got their staff to think about. Yep. And it's the people on the till who get all the hassle. If people forget to take a bag, yeah. impulse purchase, and they want a plastic bag. And I think retailers recognise from the point of view of workers, give the people the bag. And let's, let's mention those, those stores, but we, I was saying off air that there are a couple of big supermarkets who, for a while, they didn't have the plastic bags out on display, and you'd have to say, oh, could I have a bag? And they'd give you the exact number. But now they're just back out again, and you can take them. I did see a lot of people getting very angry and irate. It's a weird thing about the, the British, the English, I think, perhaps in particular. That you, how dare you take away our plastic bags? I demand, I'm buying stuff in your shop, I deserve a plastic bag. And you, you're right, it's, it's the person on the till that gets all of this hassle. Yeah, and I think, in a sense, what we have to remember is that there's two alternatives to the plastic bags. Mm. Up until about five, eight years ago, most of the supermarkets had places where the t- at the tills where you could pick up a box, cardboard box. Yep. You never see that now. Fire hazard. It's because the... Not because of a fire hazard, oh. necessarily, but because the supermarkets have a target to recycle uh, materials and packaging. And what's heavier, cardboard boxes or plastic boxes? plastic bags. So they will flatten the cardboard boxes and take them off for recycling. Bags for life are the other alternative. And you do see a lot of people these days yep. with linen bags or plastic, thicker plastic bags. But there's a problem there that it's not necessarily the answer because research in America has shown that you need to wash those bags out regularly to avoid getting problematical bacteria E. coli in those bags. Just to stop you for a second, because we've just had some very sad news that I will, will share, and then we'll come back. We just heard that uh, the actor Eric Sykes has died. He was 89 and had a short illness. Uh, Eric Sykes, of course, was a legend and worked with Spike Milligan and with Peter Sellers, and his show Sykes was one of the greatest 
sitcoms of all time. Uh, he wrote a superb autobiography as well, and uh, his manager said that he died peacefully. So it's Eric Sykes, uh, who's just died um, aged 89 this morning. Very sad. Big fan of Eric Sykes. Uh, do you know how many bags... We, do you have figures on how many bags we're using... Uh, uh, Per year, what the what the figures are? I don't keep th- things like that on. Good for you. Well done. And at the end of the day, it's a case that it's a fairly meaningless figure. I think. Yeah. You know, people uh, uh, know what bags they use. Mm. Uh, I will have plastic bags occasionally, and I tend to reuse them. Well, this is the thing. I, I, like a lot of people, I have a drawer, a bottom drawer in my kitchen that is full of plastic bags, uh, and um, that they get. We, I don't buy them, take them home, and then put them in the bin. They get used for all kinds of things. For dirty nappies, they get used for. So that, in a way, is, would, would that be classed as recycling, I suppose? It, yeah, it's a case I'd, I'd talk, I refer to it as reuse. You're okay. using it for a purpose. Yeah. That if you didn't use the plastic bags you got from a shop, you probably would have to buy mm. new bags. Yeah. So it's reusing them. You may want to put your uh, headphones uh, on, Chris, because we have a phone call from Isla in Caddington. Good morning, Isla. Morning. You're, you are a recycler, are you? I am. Uh, and w- what do you feel about this, this use of plastic bags? Do you, do, you, do you ever use them at all? Do you, I'm assuming you have a bag for life. Well, yeah, there's a couple of things. I actually carry an old-fashioned shopping bag, two oh. or three in the back of my car. There we go. And if I go shopping, where's the problem? You bring, take your bag out of your car and you go shopping. It really winds me up when I'm going around the supermarket and I see people with a trolley with 13, 14, 15... Sixteen. Just hold up the plastic bags, and I'm thinking, what's the point? If you're doing that much shopping, take something with you to put it in. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm a genius. Uh, JVS was saying this, which is when I rang originally. I sort of got wound up by the fact that why shouldn't I be given a plastic bag? Well, why should you? What, where's the problem of taking okay. taking a bag with if you? If I'm spending a hundred pounds in a supermarket, though, Isla, I'm just saying this as, as an argument. If I spend a hundred pounds in a supermarket, surely I'm entitled to a few plastic bags to take the stuff home in, aren't I? Yeah, but if you spend a pound every week yeah. and you pick up 14 plastic bags, why not take some of them back and reuse them? What do you do with 14 plastic bags every week? Yeah, well, that, no, that's an excellent point. You just don't need it. Do, do you think that people should be made to feel bad about using them? Possibly. But again, if you take them home and recycle them, which is something else I do, I work in the care industry. Yeah. And a lot of my people I work with use pads. And things. Yeah. And again, I'll carry one of these bags around in my pocket and I'll put it into the pad into a plastic bag rather than keep using more and more plastic. But that's something else that is often they're covered in plastic. And I think a lot of our waste comes Listen. from the gloves I'm using, yep. from the um, aprons I'm using, from the pads people are using. It's not just carry a plastic bag. Isla, listen, thank you very much. There's, there's a thing, the packaging. I, I once bought an apple from a petrol station. It was in a plastic apple-shaped... And cost you 35 pence. What was that about? Uh, God has, give, has given fruit its own packaging. It's got its banana peel and apple skin. We don't need packaging on fruit like that. It's all part of it. Surely one of the problems is, though, the, 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 Chris, is that people kind of think, me not taking home two plastic bags once a week... It's not going to make any difference to the world, really, is it? I think that's uh, an attitude that many people have, and I think, you know, you have to think in terms of consumerist behaviour. We buy things, we have stuff, and then we have to get rid of that stuff. Mm. People don't always realise what the implications are, and I think there's a whole lot of education that needs to be done to educate people in terms of where the materials are coming from, what happens afterwards. And again, the example on the phone is that, yeah, people who reuse plastic bags, that's fine. The danger is when you throw a plastic bag away and it gets lodged in a tree, it gets in a river and causes what people call white pollution. Mm. But that, again, is a behaviour issue. Mm. The bag doesn't move to the river on its own. It's thrown away. Mm. People would say... Uh, what's, however many plastic bags we use, China are opening up a new coal mining facility like 500 every month or something ridiculous like that. Stopping Us stopping using plastic bags in the great scheme of things compared to what's happening in the developing world, it's not really going to change anything, is it? It's a very minor element in the sense at the end of the day, plastic bags 
Um, if they're made of plastic, polyethylene, they're made from what is essentially a waste product in the oil industry. Otherwise, it would, might be used for energy recovery. Mm. And really, if you add up all the plastic bags and monitor the impact, it's a very small contribution mm. to either global warming, climate change. The big issue that many people raise is the pollution mm. caused by them. OK, we've got a call. We've got Jenny and Milton Keynes. Good morning, Jenny. Oh, good morning. Jenny, do you like your plastic bags? Uh, yeah, I actually I like my plastic bags very much. In my local large supermarket... No names, thank no, you. No, yeah, for don't. ages and ages and ages now, all their carrier bags are biodegradable, and believe you me, they fall to pieces after three months. They they even have the date by which they start really? to biodegrade printed on them. They last three months and then they just they practically fall into nothing. Chris, is this is this true? I don't think I've seen these bags. You uh, are. You pardon? I, I, I was just I was just saying to Chris that I, who's who's here with me that I don't think I've seen these bags, well, Jenny. My big okay. local supermarket, and I've been on, and I've told Jonathan this before, and yeah. he asked and he asked me which supermarket, and okay. I told him, Good for him. And, and so if they can do it, and I'm not joking, they have been yeah. doing it for a very long time now. Yeah. What is the problem? Why can't everybody else do? the same they literally fall away to nothing right. again chris i'll ask you the, the same question i tried to ask earlier i've not seen these plastic bags is, is, do they make a difference they exist i think there have been various attempts to um create alternatives there was a big phase 20 years ago to have bags that disintegrated in the sun they didn't work <laughs> You, you had to leave them. You had to leave them out in the garden for for weeks and weeks. No, they, but the thing is, these bags sorry, do Chris. work. This, right. this it isn't a joke. No, these bags sorry. actually work. Jenny, so you don't feel naughty using no, these bags? No, I don't then. feel naughty. I think it's a. I think it's perfectly right. I mean, what's wrong with a carrier? It, I've seen it. They, uh, you, okay. they literally fall to pieces after three months. What is the problem? Why are people making it into a bigger problem than it needs to be? Just get biodegradable bags. It's up to the supermarkets to do that. My supermarket has been doing it for a long time. Are they strong enough to get... Yes. All of your... Yes. As long, shopping well, as, as long as you're not going to walk as long Home. as you're not going to walk miles with it yeah what's the furthest do you think you could walk with it well i don't know i haven't tested it out okay, well, but i mean I, I i i don't i don't just walk from the till out to a car i have to walk home with mine yes, okay. so but i'm not so i'm not so i'm walking further than just from the till into the car park okay. and i and i've and you know and i'm all right but the po- what point i'm trying to very make brief if is, you would jenny Eh? Very briefly, if you would. They fall to pieces. It's simple. Thank you very much. That was nice and brief. That was Jenny there, with uh, who's very passionate. People do get very. I'm, I'm, my tongue. People do get very passionate uh, about this kind of thing. People do feel it's an entitlement to have these bags. Now, you know, it is this English attitude of don't mess with, don't mess with what we've got going on, for goodness sakes. Uh, Chris, uh, Professor Chris Coggins is a resource and waste consultant based in Luton. Thank you very much for your time. Very nice talking to you. Uh, the Consumer Hour is coming up after this. This is Emin, Baby Get Higher. I am really enjoying the show this morning. I'm having a lot of fun. I hope you are as well. Coming up after 11, it's the Consumer Hour. We've got some cracking stories for you today, including this one about Ray. He's a bit self-conscious about his thinning hair. When he saw a company offering a half-price deal for a hair transplant on the website, he booked a consultation. The guy didn't look at my hair in assault enough detail. He literally looked at it from across the other end of the table, told me what I needed and told me that if I did it you know, pretty much immediately, he would do it for X amount. The quote for the surgery was £3,600 with a 50% deposit of £1,800. Ray cancelled a month before his surgery date, but he hasn't been granted a refund. We'll get an update on that and loads more stories, but first of all, his time for the travel. As well as hearing from Ray, we'll be getting updates about Hazel and her flight to India. Will she get the £25 back that she's after? All of that and more after the latest news on BBC Three Counties Radio. 
It's the JVS Show. This is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan. And between now and 12, I'll be looking at your consumer problems. And if you've got an issue that you'd like us to look at, then do get in touch with the team. 08459 455 555. Today, there's going to be an update for Hazel. Hazel was looking to meet some friends in India in December of this year, so she booked up with an online agent for over £700. Two weeks later, she was informed that her airline was no longer operating and she'd have to apply for a refund. I got all my money back apart from £25, which they say is a cancellation fee, but I haven't cancelled. My friends that I was going with, they have got all their money back and I haven't. Hazel's contacted the agent to ask why she's being charged a cancellation fee when she hasn't cancelled anything, but there have been no replies. I'll also be talking to Leisha. Now, a few months ago, Leisha had a sewage problem in her housing association flat. The toilet was blocked. She tried to sort it out, but had to call the housing association. In the end, they sent out a drainage person to come and try and unblock it. He actually made the problem worse, where it started to flow into my bath. Raw sewage coming up into your bath? Yeah, literally other people's sewage, feces, tissues, you know, the lot, anything you could think of. This is the most disgusting story. All of this has ruined Leisha's flooring and bath mats, along with all the towels it took to clean up. There's an estimated cost of nearly a £1,000 to replace everything. We'll get an update on that and find out how things are going with a load more stories as well. The JVS Show. Fighting for your rights and tackling your consumer problems. The JVS Show. BBC Three Counties Radio. If you've got a problem, give us a call. 08459 455 555. And we'll do our best to see if we can sort it out. But before that... Fleetwood Mac, Dreams. Fleetwood Mac and Dreams. I used to hate Fleetwood Mac. And then I read a fantastic book about the guitarist, Lindsay Buckingham. And just fell in love with them. Rumours, Tusk and Tango in the Night. Three of the greatest albums of all time. Wonderful, wonderful. This is Ian Lee filling in for uh, Jonathan Vernon Smith while he's off having a nice fancy holiday somewhere in the sunshine and we're stuck in the pouring rain, which is... uh, well, you know, that's what we have to do. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give us a call with any of your consumer problems. But I must make you aware of this, that next Monday the Olympic torch concludes its journey across the three counties. After a very early start in Luton, the torch makes its way through Dunstable and on to Milton Keynes. It's then on to Bletchley, Buckingham and Winslow. After Whitchurch, the torch will make its way through Aylesbury, Stoke Mandeville and then on to Waddesdon. And we will be there so you don't miss a thing. We are your Olympic station. We're BBC Three Counties Radio. I think we can go to Vladimir uh, on line three. Good morning, Vladimir. Hello, good morning. How are you, sir? Absolutely marvellous, and you? <laughs> I'm not as good as that, but I'm, I'm doing OK. What's your story, Vladimir? I mean, what's the problem? And please don't mention any company names or brand names. Yeah, I certainly won't. Basically, what has happened, um, it was my partner's birthday. Yes. And uh, I thought I'm going to buy her a present, so I went online, and I went to one of those uh, internet companies, and I have bought her a vo- voucher yep. for a pair of boots. Then what we did, uh, we received the voucher, which, which was brilliant. Yes. Uh, she went to redeem the voucher, did, uh, followed all the instructions, did everything she had to, left her bank details and uh, address and her name and everything she should on a ma- uh, answer machine with a franchise. But unfortunately, the boots have never arrived with us. So what I've done about a month later, I have sent an email to the internet company, internet-based company, asking if they could uh, investigate for us. I got lovely email back saying that they will, and uh, they forwarded, forwarded me emails for the franchise as well and asked me if I can email them. So I did, and I have received email from the franchise stating that they have shipped the order a uh, couple of weeks prior to my email and that I should call the internet-based company again which then I did, but unfortunately the number they gave me uh, was uh, not complaints or anything like that. Uh, The number they gave me was meant to be dealing with uh, redeeming vouchers only, and as my voucher by that time was already redeemed, they couldn't help me. So they advised me that I should send another email to the internet-based company, which I did. Uh, Then I got email back from them saying that they will investigate the case again, 
and uh, after a few days i got another email from the internet based company stating that uh basically the merchant has never received the order so i've gone back to them saying well they did receive the order because they said that they shipped the goods and uh, this has gone back and forward a few times and uh, now the last email i've received from them says well we are terribly sorry but they have never received your order and uh, the voucher has expired so we cannot uh, give you the oh. your boots nor refund so hang on so first so you you bought some vouchers from a company you went to use these vouchers at another company is that correct that is correct yes and you to buy some boots the boots never arrived and the second company where you got the boots from they initially yes. said they had sent the boots out a few weeks ago that's correct, yes. And they did they, w- when they said that, order. did they send you any um, uh, tracking number or, or anything like that, any proof that they'd sent it out? No, they did not. But you have an email from them saying they'd sent it out? Yes, okay. I do have an email stating that they shipped the order. You then went back to Company A. Yes. And they said that actually Company B never received the order. That's correct. This is uh, very confusing in an SMS. As always in these situations, I, I, I bow to superior knowledge. I look to Ben. Ben, this sounds like a mess. It, it does sound rather confusing. I mean, I don't buy many shoes. I don't know about you, but I only have about three pairs of shoes. I think, yes, but I, I have um, some smart shoes and two <laughs> pairs of shoes that are not smart. That's it, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know a lot about shoe shopping, I must admit. So, um, But it's, it sounds like... Yeah, I think we'll need to speak to both companies and yeah. find out exactly where we stand with the voucher. Because obviously this isn't a normal transaction where you pay by, say, credit card, debit yeah. card, something like that. You're using this voucher and then using the voucher to pay for something. So. And there was a time limit, uh, Vladimir, on these vouchers and how long they could be used for. That's correct, yes. The voucher I have bought basically needed to be used by, if I'm correct, it was the 3rd of March 2012. Okay. Now, the, the, we, what's, what's interesting here, Ben, is that the company B, mm. the, the shoe company, initially said they had sent them out, and now they're saying they haven't sent them out. That's we, what's, what's making me scratch my head on this. Yeah, there seems there seems to be some confusion here, whether that's between the two companies involved here, whether it's uh, a mix-up in communication, whether it's something that's gone... Things go lost in the post sometimes. So yep. we, we need to track down exactly what's happened to these to these um, yeah. uh, these shoes and find out where we go from But then there. to deny that they've ever sent them out. Very puzzling. And not received the order. What, what, and what is frustrating with a lot of these companies that are online, it's very hard to find a phone number. To, it's very hard to find a phone number that you can talk to someone. Yeah. But you can't... With, with enough scouring, Vladimir, of the internet, all of these companies have got phone numbers. And, yes. and Ben and I, we are gonna, we're going to hunt and we're going to find them. Vladimir, yeah, listen, thank you very much for that. We will certainly look into that. Then is it we can... We can absolutely, look we'll look into that, no problem. Vladimir, we will let you know how we progress with that. I think we can definitely look into that. 08459 455 555. This is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith uh, on uh, the Jonathan Vernon-Smith show, surprisingly. If, uh, uh, allow me to go off on a tangent very slightly. I don't know if you heard the news at the top of the hour that uh, Eric Sykes uh, has passed away. He was 89, was, at, was 89 years old and he passed away peacefully this morning. Uh, if you're if you if you're unaware of who Eric Sykes is, I'm I'm guessing there will be some younger listeners who are going what? Go on YouTube and go and watch the plank. Just go and watch it. Now it, it may not be to everyone's cup of tea, and it has dated slightly, but it's flipping brilliant. It's genius, and you know Eric Sykes was one of the greatest comedy writers and performers the, 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 in the world. A very British. Uh, sense of humour, but was just fantastic. And he's one of those people that was on my list of people I wanted to interview, and I never got round to doing it, and I'm kicking myself now. Really sad news that uh, Eric Sykes has passed away. Now, back to the consumer hour. Paul told us that he and his wife had put their house on the market. They got a buyer very quickly um, and found the house they wanted. So they thought it would all go through really smoothly. Our mortgage with our mortgage lender was, was portable, uh, or, or so we thought. We wasn't after any more money at all. Tried to port it, but it now appears not quite that straightforward. Uh, it is like sort of reapplying for a mortgage with them. Uh, have you got it in writing that no, the mortgage is portable? We can't find the initial um, paperwork. We do keep everything, but that seems to have disappeared. The mortgage lender has said they won't port the mortgage due to affordability, but Paul doesn't want to borrow any more money. The house they want costs less. 
Paul told us that he struggled to get through to anyone on the helpline. So, have we been able to get anywhere? We've got Paul on the line now. Good morning, Paul. Hi, good morning, Ian. Paul, what's the, bring me up to speed on this. Obviously, Jonathan's been dealing with this. What's the, what's the situation you're at now? Uh, well, it did start to kind of move forward fairly quick. Well, I say quickly. Uh, it, was, it appeared to be going better. Jonathan uh, got in touch with them, and, and we was getting somewhere. We, 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 there was a little bit of information still that they needed off us, uh, some accounts. So we sent all that off. Yeah. Um, and they then told us that we needed to wait another three to five days, which is their stock answer, um, uh, to, to get a, a, an answer from them. Um, waited five working days as usual. Uh, phoned them up um, to be told that um, they looked on the system. They said, oh, it's by the looks of it, the application's been declined. Uh, I said, well, why is that? Um, she said, well, it's down to affordability. I said, well, is it possible to just speak to somebody uh, in the porting department or the um, underwriters? And she said, well, no, not anymore. According to uh, the system now, the case has been closed. Uh, and that was it. So, hmm. well, where do we go from here? Um, she said, well, the only thing you could do is, is complain. So I said, OK, then I want to complain. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll do that then, yes. <laughs> so, uh, again, so we, we've, we've, we've had a complaint number. Um, and again, need to wait the usual three to five working days for a letter to arrive. Uh, I've no idea what the letter's going to say. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be how we can sort of progress on with the complaint. Um, and, so and compl- complaining, is, we... complaining is fine, but you want the situation you want the situation to be resolved. You want yeah, a port yeah. so I mean, you can I get mean, this I house. Did actually, when, when Jonathan um, got on to him a couple of weeks ago, um, <clears> we did actually say, because we made a complaint, because this has gone on for many, many weeks, uh, and I foolishly said, you know, we don't want to complain, we just want it sorted, it should be really easy. Mm. Um, but obviously now um, it seems to have hit a real kind of brick wall. Well, Paul, it. mortgages I, I just find a nightmare. I, I, I get asked, one of the security questions when I phone up my mortgage provider is, what kind of mortgage have you got? I don't know. I, I, I just, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we have an expert on the line. We've got Sebastian Murphy, who is head of mortgages at JLM Mortgage Services Limited in Hitching. Good morning, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, Ian. Now, you have, have heard what Paul said, and I sent you over some bits and pieces yesterday. You did. You've had a look at the situation. Is, is this normal? Is it, are, are the company right to do this? It sounds like a, a, a quite a straightforward thing to port the mortgage. I know you, you would think it, uh, you know, the lender would be you know, sort of keen to uh, obviously allow uh, Paul to port the mortgage, especially if he's looking to reduce his loan uh, and therefore if he, you know, reduce his kind of debt to them. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, uh, Paul's dealing with a, with a company which uh, obviously now don't really have an appetite to lend. Right. Uh, and so... The, and this is, the, this is the general trend at the moment, isn't it? Well, lenders do have an appetite to lend, but there's definitely a trend uh, with the fact that uh, with the clause reporting, and this is the, the, the bit, obviously, of Paul of manages to find his mortgage offer, you'll, you'll probably see it in, in very, very small print. It will say that uh, the mortgage is, uh, well, it's possible to port the mortgage he has. Um, however, it is down to uh, Paul fulfilling uh, their criteria at the time. And, and as we all know, the goalposts on mortgages have moved quite dramatically in the last two or three years. So what, were the, what, what are those goalposts? So that, that's income? Income. And, you know, uh, you know we've, we've all seen, you know, including ourselves, you know, uh, sort of a, a drop in income perhaps since 2008. Mm. Uh, and so uh, lenders are only keen to, uh, you know, allow clients to port the mortgage if their income is the same um, as it was when they applied for the mortgage originally. Uh, and so we're seeing more and more people, and I, I know it's no consolation to Paul, but mm. unfortunately it's, it's a very common problem where people believe they can, you know, move with the lender uh, and, uh, you know, sort of take advantage perhaps of a low variable rate or just take advantage of, of it being, you know, sort of hassle-free. Uh, but unfortunately the lender, you know, as with all lenders, uh, are trying to perhaps uh, minimise risk. And I know we've say Paul's a particular lender because they're not... Uh, looking to sort of attract new business. In fact, they're, you know, you know really trying to offload clients at the moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting worried now because uh, I, I'm thinking of possibly moving and I, I've not earned this, as much this year as I did last year. Well, it is a problem, you know. Uh, I suppose... Uh, you know, there are lots of lenders out there which do have a very sort of, uh, you know, sort of keen appetite to lend at the moment. So, you know, I wouldn't say the mortgage market is flat. There's still some very, very good lenders uh, who have some, say, very competitive rates at the moment who do want market share. 
Um, but we are finding a lot of people having to swap from their existing lenders, which they've been, you know, sort of fantastic customers yeah. uh, to and, you know, had sort of great loyalty to over the years, just because that lender's perhaps had a change of ownership or uh, a change of sort of business direction. Uh, and yes, you know, unfortunately, it, it is stopping the housing wow. market from uh, progressing. Paul, uh, it's no. Co- has your income Thanks changed? <laughs> yeah, wait, oh, no, sorry. Paul, sorry. <laughs> it's no consolation, is it? <laughs> has your income changed? Um, yeah, it has. I mean, when um, when I, when we first took out the mortgage, I was employed and self-employed. Yeah. Um, so I had sort of two businesses running. Um, it finished the employment side of it, so now just solely self-employed. So obviously, there's not quite so much security there, perhaps as, as there was yeah. um, last year. The books wasn't fantastic. We we, we changed the business sort of uh, a little bit, um, but now it's back up and, and running. Um, my accountant sent various information off to them, but they yeah, and not interested. you are no. Sebastian, <laughs> and, is, there, is there is there anything that Paul can do, Sebastian? Yeah, there is. I mean, to be fair um, to uh, to Paul, as you said, I, I know how frustrating it is. You know, we spend all day kind of banging our head against the uh, against a brick wall. You know, dealing with lenders. Uh, and we, you know, obviously have lots of experience with dealing with them. Um, if you've had a very good year this year and you've come to the end of your, uh, say, tax year, uh, yeah. and uh, your you know, figures are, say, greatly improved or, or just up from last year, um, you'll find that many lenders will just look at your last year's uh, set of figures. And right. they won't take, say, an average over the last three years. They'll just look yeah. at the most recent year because they see that as being the most realistic and the most relevant to your, you know, current situation and current earnings. Yeah especially in, the, obviously, the, the difficult market we've all had. Um, and I imagine the lender you're with, uh, you don't have any penalties, uh, so you can move away from them. And I imagine you would get a much better rate with one of the big high street lenders basing it on the figures for this year. Chaps, yeah. listen, we've got to end it there because we're running out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Paul, it's not great news, I'm afraid. And thank you, Sebastian Murphy, who's head of mortgages at JLM Mortgages Services Limited in Hitchin. It's not brilliant news. I'm getting worried now. I want to move. I don't know if I can. Nick Coffer's in. Good morning. Good morning. We haven't got much time, I'm afraid. Sorry, very it's quickly. a very packed show. <laughs> poetry. Yes. Which I'm slightly unsure about. I've never been a huge poetry lover, so I'm yep. quite looking forward to this. Hopefully David Gwillam Anthony will convince me otherwise. He's from Buckinghamshire. Superb. Uh, he's a poet. And uh, after two o'clock today, yesterday we had uh, brilliant financial advice. Today we've got a vet coming in. Uh, any questions relating to your animals? Love it. We've got a vet. Julia Boness, get your calls in on 08459 She's here to answer your calls. God bless you for doing that, sir. Uh, Nick Coffer's on at midday. Should be a good show. A vet on the radio. Fantastic. I will phone in about my cat, who's just uh, comp- incredibly overweight. Uh, this is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan Vernon-Smith. More of your calls after this from Ace. This is Ian Lee filling in for JVS. It's the Consumer Hour. Coming up after the news and travel, we hear from Leisha, who had a sewage problem in her housing association flat. The toilet was blocked. She tried to sort it out, but had to call the housing association. They sent out a drainage person to come and try and unblock it. He actually made the problem worse, where it started to flow into my bath. Raw sewage coming up into your bath? Yeah, literally other people's sewage, faeces, tissues. You know, the lot... What do you want to happen now? What are you looking for? Well, I just feel that they haven't compensated me. I mean, I've lost all my flooring that I had laid down. I lost out on rugs, my bathroom mat, towels... I love how disgusted JVS is when he hears what's going on. All of this has ruined Leisha's flooring and bath mats, along with all of the towels it took to clean up. There's an estimated cost of nearly £1,000 to replace everything. We'll find out what the latest is on that after the news and travel. On FM, AM and online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Don't forget, Nick Coffer is coming on at midday. He, uh, he popped in briefly there, but uh, the show is always worth a listen. He has a very odd mix of guests, and I love it for that very reason. Now, we have got Jean on the line. Jean, tell me your consumer problem without mentioning any company names or details, please. OK, then. Um, I, I had a carpet laid two and a half months ago, yep. and um, I noticed there's some pat- big patches coming up on it. I've got no animals, there's only me that live here, and when I do have company, they don't come in with their shoes on or nothing. Anyway, I went up, I phoned the manager at the company where I got it from, Yeah. and he said, OK, I'll come down and have a look. He came down and he said, 
Oh, he said, sometimes the carpet changes colour. So I said, well, if I wanted that colour, I would have picked it. So he said, OK, then. He said, I'll get the manufacturers down. So the manufacturers come down, they took a photo, asked, you know, took details, and I said, there's new underlay and everything. OK, he said, um, you should hear within seven to ten days. Well, I left it for two weeks. And I went up to the company and I saw the manager and he said, oh yes, he said, we've heard from the manufacturers, they said it's wear and tear. So I said, how can it be wear and tear? Two and a half months and nobody goes in there, only me. And when do people come, they don't have their shoes on. Oh, he said, um, okay, leave it with me for another seven days, I'll get on to the manufacturers. Anyway, I went up there again last week and he said, well, the manufacturers are not doing nothing. So I said, so what are you going to do? So he said, well, I'll, try, I'll get on to the um, head office and I've still heard nothing. And this has been going on for three weeks. Jean, can I ask a couple of quick questions? How much did the carpet cost? Well, uh, the actual price was £1,400, but I got it for six. 619 plus 60 pounds for laying everything um, because I've got the bill with everything on Good. and they said I've got this much off it so I've got everything detailed but the manager agrees and said yes it's not wear and tear he agrees with me does it have any protection on it because sometimes when you buy a new carpet they, you can get, like, special protective stuff that they put on it to make it last longer. Did you get anything like that on it? No, I had nothing on it. And when the manager agreed that it wasn't wear and tear, mm -hmm. did he say that to you, or did he write that in a letter, or...? No, he said it to me, and the under-manager said it to me as well. But they didn't write anything? No. OK, I think I know what we're going to do with this, and we're, we're, let, let's go to Ben. Ben? Mm-hmm. You've been listening to this. I have, yeah. And, Jean, it's that, you, you sound like you're quite upset about this, and it's a lot of money, isn't it? Yes, it is. I, I am really upset about it. And uh, you, you expect a carpet to last a little bit longer than a couple of months. I would have thought, Ben. Mm. Well, like, if I had had a family or animals, even then, yeah. you can't say wear and tear for, no. what, well. less than ten weeks. And do you say it's, it's patches? Uh, what, what colour are the patches? Are they just as... Has it kind of lost some of its colour, or...? No, it's, it's like a light... Because it's a very light carpet, and it's like a very light brown coming through. Oh, that's not very nice. Gene, uh, this is what I'm going to do. I don't know if I have the authority to do this, but I'm here for a week, so my, my rules. Ben. Yes. Would you be able to go over to Jean's place, Yeah. have a little look, Yeah. maybe have a cup of tea, I don't know, uh, <laughs> and, and take some photos of this so we can see what's been going on and, and just how, what the, the, the damage is? Yeah, we can take a look at the Would car. that be all right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Would you mind, Jean, if I send Ben over? He's very clean, and he'll take his shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, then. Yeah. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Listen, I, I, I'll get Ben to give you a call later on. Yeah. We'll sort out a day that you can come over and have a look, and we'll take some photos, and we'll put them up on our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, I think if we've got some visual evidence, mm -hmm. it makes it a little bit easier for us to progress with this story, I think. Yes. OK. okay. Ben, is that right? Well, that's absolutely fine, yeah, that sounds great. Perfect. Jean, we'll, we'll speak to you later on. Um, but I won't be back because I'm going to the hospital at quarter to twelve. We won't, OK, listen, we won't be popping over today. Oh, OK. We, it, it'll probably be, it might be next week. We'll, oh. Ben will give you a call. Be, I'll, I'll have a chat. We'll, we'll, we'll talk when, because I want a cup of tea as well when I go <laughs> over. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll sort it all out. Don't you worry, yeah, Jean, OK? Fine. Jean, don't panic, don't worry. Ben okay. will be in touch and we will sort this, we will sort him out coming to have a little visit, OK? Oh, lovely. Jean, thank, thank you. you very much. Take care. There you go. And ben, I, I have to say, Ben is a very nice man, and he is very clean. I would, I would not send him out uh, if he was uh, not clean. Now, a few months ago, in this story I just find uh, the, I incredible, uh, Leisha had a sewage problem in her housing association flat. The toilet was blocked. She tried to sort it out, but had to call the housing association. Um, she's dead. They sent out a drainage person to come and try and unblock it. He actually made the problem worse, where it started to flow into my bath. Raw sewage coming up into your bath? Yeah, literally. Other people's 
sewage, feces, tissues, you know, the lot. What do you want to happen now? What are you looking for? Well, I just feel that they haven't compensated me. I mean, I've lost all my flooring that I had laid down. Yep. I lost out on rugs, my bathroom mat, towels. It just, I, it just it sounds absolutely hideous. Leisha, you're on the line now. Hello, Leisha. Hiya. Uh, now, Ben, you've been dealing with this problem as well. Yes. Where, where are we? Who, who knows where we are and what's going on with this? Well, yes, we, we've been coordinating with the, um, uh, with the Housing Association on this. Mm. And um, I, I think last time we spoke earlier this week, um, uh, we were discussing this, Ian, and, and I, I recommended, Leisha, you need to write a letter. But in the meantime, between then and now, we've had a response from the, the, the Housing Association. OK, what do they say? So what they said is, um, uh, when Leisha first reported the problem to us, we attended the same day and sent cleaners the following day. Now, we investigated the cause of the problem, which was found to be a build-up of fat and grease that has blocked pipes in the building. We have unblocked these pipes and have written to all residents in the block to ask them not to pour fatty liquids down the sink. Mm. Unfortunately, unforeseeable events like this do happen, which is why we always advise residents to take out contents insurance to safeguard against any accidental damage to their possessions. Now, our money advice team can help residents arrange this at a price that is affordable or residents can make their own arrangements. The team can also help with any other financial concerns that Leisha may have. However... They say uh, we do sympathise with uh, Leisha's situation and we have offered her £250 as a goodwill gesture. Mm. Now, a couple of things here. Leisha, first off, they mention um, uh, contents insurance. Do you have any contents insurance? No, but when I first moved in, they never mentioned about getting any of that neither. Well, uh, no, but I I think a a good bit of advice for anybody, whether you're buying a house or you're renting somewhere or you're in housing associate, I think contents insurance is is kind of pretty essential for things like this. This. Yes. Uh, however, um, the other thing here is is they've mentioned this £250 as a goodwill gesture. How does that sound, Leisha? Does that come somewhere near to the costs that you you think you'll, you've incurred because of this? Well, I've, I've worked it out that it wouldn't even cover to actually replace the flooring, which I wouldn't mind if it would actually just replace the flooring. Mm. But as it's not going to cover it, I was a bit like, well... Would the housing association yeah. not be responsible to replace the flooring anyway? Well, that would be um, that would be up for debate. And right. That's, okay. That's, that's why um, okay. Leisha needs to write this letter. I think Leisha. I think this adds to the fact that you need to write a letter saying thank you very much for the, for the offer. Yeah. Um, and I think you need to outline how you feel about this. Yeah. Um, outline your reasons why £250 you feel isn't enough to cover the things yeah. um, that you've outlined to us things such as flooring um, bath mats, rugs to have to mop up the, the, the sewage yeah. and then explain to them your side of it and then see what comes back. There are a number of options that, that can be pursued down the line but I think that first step is putting something in writing. Yeah. So Alicia you need to write down a list of everything that was damaged, right. how much it cost get, get a total, send that to the housing association, you can send us a copy as well if you want that probably make things a little bit easier at, yeah. at our end um and then we can see what their response is all right well i'll get that written up today then and sent off the quicker you do that i mean this is it's going to take a, a little while but the quicker you do that the quicker we can kind of move on to the next step well that's it i've been waiting long enough for this floor in anyway leisha listen thank you very much send us that letter when you, you've got it you can either email it to ben or you can you can send us in but i think that's that's a good idea and uh contents insurance is, is, it's kind of a, an essential thing isn't it really for yeah. things like this it's, it's one of those things insurance is always you you think about it last and then when you need it you think oh why didn't i, think I wish it? i yeah. had done that and it's a few you quid, but as I was saying earlier, I, I broke a computer and wouldn't claim on my contents insurance. But if I'd had that problem with the sewage coming up and the, the floor had been ruined, you would, you would kind of have to. That's all it's there for. Uh, this is Ian Lee filling in for Jonathan Vernon Smith. It's the consumer hour. Time for Plan B. Plan B, she said, brackets, no rap version, close brackets. He's good, he is. Now, Ray is a little bit self-conscious about his thinning hair when he saw a company offering a half-price deal for a hair transplant on their website. He went to see a consultant. Ray said it felt like a double-glazing sales pitch. He was quoted a price of £3,600 and paid a 50% deposit of £1,800. I chased them for a date for surgery. I was eventually given a date. I had no further correspondence there afterwards. It got alarm bells uh, ringing and I started doing a bit of my own research and found out that some of the before and after photographs I'd initially seen were not their own work. Some of them were apparently photoshopped, some of them were borrowed from other companies. And when I looked back on their website, those photos were no longer there. So Ray cancelled the surgery date he'd been given, but has not received a refund. Hello, Ray. Hello. How are you doing? You're right. 
Uh, reasonably, yeah. OK, well, that, that, let's, Ben has been, been handling this. I'm aware of all of these cases because I've been listening for the last sort of six weeks or so and I, I feel like I know all of these people. But, uh, Ben, you've been chasing this up. Where are we with this, yeah, please? Yeah, well, the last we heard from Ray, we thought, Ray, we'd sent you off a happy person. We thought the last we heard from the company was... Absolutely. We need Ray to come into our offices to sign uh, what they call a non-disclosure agreement, which basically means he wouldn't be able to talk to us or any person once he signed that document. But he would get the money back. But he would get the money back. They even said, as a goodwill gesture, we'll pay the transport fees to get Ray into their offices and back again. So we thought, excellent. They said they'd be in contact. Ray, have they been in contact? I've heard absolutely nothing since. Nothing on your mobile, no messages, no emails... Nothing whatsoever. Mm. Have you, Ray, can I ask, have you tried to call them? Uh, no, I haven't, purely because I don't know who it is that you guys have been dealing with and I wouldn't know who to ask for and it, it just gets complicated. I mean, it's the same problem I had first time when I was trying to contact them. Ben, is there something in, in, in getting Ray to make that first move? Tell you what, I think we need to put a, a call into this company okay. um, immediately after the programme. We need to get this rolling because, yeah. you know, this has been going on long enough. So. They said they're going to give the money back. We Absolutely. just need to chase them up on this and make sure they do now. Yes. So I think what, what I'll make sure is that the person we've been talking with, we've been speaking with one person at this particular uh, clinic. So we'll, we'll make sure that we speak to this person, make sure they coordinate with Ray as soon as possible. I, I hope that they will get someone to speak to him this afternoon. Um, that's what I'll say we'll be expecting, but um, Ray, hopefully, we'll get someone to, to get in contact with you. If not, I will attempt to get some contact details that you can use to chase them up, alright? That'd be great. Lovely. Hopefully this will, no offence Ray, but hopefully this will be the last time we hear from you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ray, yeah, go, go away. We will, we will, yeah. we'll, we'll listen, we'll, Ben will get on that, to, onto that today and we will sort out and see what we can, uh, what, what, what we can do. It's, it's very frustrating, isn't it, when these, um, when these things happen. Now, Hazel was looking to meet some friends in India in December of this year, so she booked up with an online agent for over £700. After booking for two weeks, I was then informed by the, the company that the airline would no longer be operating and, oh. we, and we, we would have to apply for a refund. I got all my money back apart from £25, which they say is a cancellation fee, but I haven't cancelled. My friends that I was going with, they have got all their money back and I haven't. <sighs> Well, Hazel shouldn't be charged a cancellation fee. We've got her on the line now. Ben, I've just emailed you over the ISDN line for um, our lady from Aptus. Hopefully we can get hold of her as well at some point, if that's possible. Hazel! Hello. It's not looking good, is it? No. So this, the, 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 the flight was cancelled because they weren't doing this flight anymore. Everyone's got their money back, but you've had to pay this cancellation fee of £25. That's correct. How is that making you feel? Well, I didn't cancel it Mm. at the end of the day, so um, I don't see why I should have to pay £25 um, for something that I haven't cancelled. It it does seem um, odd to me, bearing in mind I've just kind of stepped in and and, and taken over from Jonathan, who has been uh, following all of this very closely. It does seem odd that you should be penalised for um, something that isn't your fault. Well, that's how I feel. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we have uh, we're trying to get hold of some uh, Gillian Edwards from ABTA, and um, uh, I may have uh, somehow we may have got the numbers slightly confused because we're unable to get hold of her at the moment. But she, oh no, maybe we have got her. I'm getting no, we haven't got her. <laughs> that's my. <laughs> I know roughly what she was going to say. She um, said that judging from the companies, she said that this is kind of probably standard procedure, uh, and that these things often happen. Then she said that she looked at the terms and conditions on the website, and it's a little bit vague. Have you got a copy of your initial contract with the company? Um, Well, because you asked me, I actually went into it, because, I mean, all the terms and conditions, I mean, they're so long. Of course they are, yeah. I mean, I would think most people don't actually read them word for word, but yes, I have got a copy. You have got a copy. Have you got access to a scanner? Is there a way that you could email this over to us? Oh, I did. Did you? 
Yes. When did you email it? Yesterday. Did you email it yesterday? Who did you email it to? Me or Jonathan? Uh, no, I done it to um, an Ian Dot Lee. That's me. Yeah. That's me. Well, that's my. <laughs> it hasn't. It hasn't come through to me, Hazel. Oh right. It hasn't come through. I tell you what we'll do. You've got. Have you got Ben's email address? No, I haven't. Okay. What we'll do is we'll give you a call a bit later on after the show. Right. We'll give you Ben email's address, uh, and um, if you can send it to Ben, and we will have a, a, a little look at it, and that way we can actually forward it to Gillian from ABTA. Yeah, no problem. That's fine. And um, and then we can get her back on, and she can have a proper look because she said that the wording on the um, the internet their website was a little bit vague and a little bit fluffy. Uh, and that the contract would be a little bit more specific for us and could perhaps tell us a little bit more information. So, if you could... I tell you what, if you stay on the line... Uh-huh. Well, I'll hand you over to Ben. Ben will give you his email address. I will, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ben. Uh, and um, we, will, we'll, we will see if we can get that... Um, we'll, we'll get that forwarded on to the lady from Abdur. Is that OK? OK, that's great. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. you very much. You stay there, Ben. We'll, we'll, we'll grab you uh, and we'll have a little chat with you and we can... Uh, oh, no, hang on a second. We've got... Gillian, I do... Po- Gillian, I have to apologise. Gillian Edwards is uh, from Abtur. We are having terrible problems with our phones this morning and I think we managed to keep it pretty well hidden uh, and, until this last minute. Gillian, are you there? I am. I, I can only apologise that we're, we're having a little bit of a problem. Hazel, are you still there? Oh, I am. Okay, Gillian, okay. Is, Gillian is the expert from Abtur who has very kindly agreed to come on. Gillian, what's your kind of take on this? So I, I've passed the um, inquiry over to our Consumer Affairs team. We've had a look through it um, and in the, the email that we'd seen, the chain of correspondence, they'd referred to their policy on their website. Now, from looking at the website, the terms and conditions seem to refer to a £25 charge when the when a cancellation has been made by the customer or a notification to change the details has been made by the customer. But it doesn't actually specify what happens if the airline, in this case, um, ha- has has gone or changed, cancelled the route. So it's not the customer's choice to cancel. So I don't know if there's anything that specifically relates to that in the lady's terms and conditions. So hang on, you're saying that if we were just to go by the website, and let's forget the terms and conditions in her contract for the moment, that, that she could be entitled to that £25 because it's them, the, the company, that, that cancelled the booking? That's right. Well, this is interesting. Well, what's going to happen, Gillian, is uh, Hazel has found that contract for us. She's going to send it over to us today. Would that be all right, Gillian, if we forwarded it on to you to have a little look at? Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. OK, we'll, we'll get that done um, today, tomorrow at the latest. We'll try and get it done today. Um, and then maybe we can come back to you later in the week, Gillian, and have a little look at um, uh, what's going on with that. Yeah, no problem. And thank you very much for your patience and for, for coming on. I know things are a little bit all over the place at the moment. That's it's possibly my fault. I think I may have broken a machine somewhere. <laughs> Gillian, thank you very much. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Hazel, there is, there is a tiny light at the end of the tunnel. Not promising anything but we'll we'll if you speak to ben stay on the line speak to ben get his email um and um we can forward that on to an expert is that okay okay that's lovely thank Brilliant, you Hazel. so much thank for you your very help much. No, it's, it's, it's a pleasure it's, you know it's, it's uh, we're doing our best boys i don't think i thought we'd get away without mentioning the phone problems for the whole show then at the last minute i i, I gave in and, and and had to uh from next friday afternoon through to the monday morning we're taking bbc three counties radio on the road we'll be broadcasting all our programs live from the center of the love luton 2012 festival with reporters following the olympic torch every step of the way through the three counties come down to wardown park in luton and you can challenge justin dealey's jukebox or help jvs celebrate the torch arriving in luton we are your Olympic Station with BBC Three Counties Radio. This is Ian Lee filling in for JVS. On tomorrow's programme, I'm going to be talking uh, about some research from a psychologist who advises an organisation called the Save Childhood Movement. Dr Richard House says that computer games are hindering children from learning about being human. We know that computer games are criticised for being a waste of time or for introducing children to violence too young, but are they stopping development in very fundamental ways? I would love... This is a great debate. I would love to hear your stories. Uh, If you've got kids... Do you let them play with video games? What age did you kind of start letting them play? Are you dead against them? Uh, or maybe you're an adult gamer and you've been playing games since you had a Spectrum back in uh, 1982 or something. You're kind of thinking, what's the problem? They're just video games. It's going to be a lot of fun and um, I will uh, confess my vested interest tomorrow. Uh, time now before Nick Coffer, though. Let's get the latest travel news, I think. 
So don't forget to listen tomorrow from nine as I fill in for Jonathan and we talk video games and more of your consumer problems. And coming up after 12, it's Nick Coffer, who is always worth a listen, has some fantastic guests on. Before that, it's the latest news. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. 